Hi, this is a sound check. I'm just saying to say that some numbers. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Thank you. This is another sound check. We are currently trying to figure out the delay we need for our captioning. One, two, three, four, five. See you in a second.
This is the third and probably final sound check. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Hey everyone! <laughs> um, so let's get started. Welcome to Enthusiasticon 2020. Um, this is the fourth time we're doing this event and we're super excited. Um, in the past month we've like reviewed a lot of talks, submissions by you all and built a schedule and prepared all of these communication channels. And yeah, we can't wait to get started. Um, we want, however, start this event on a serious note, because this is kind of a strange time to do a conference about joy, right? Because not only are we in the middle of a global virus pandemic, um, there's also like a current escalation of open racism and police brutality in the US. Um, and we wanted to point out that we like see and feel that contrast between people suffering and dying and having a hard time and us doing this little conference about joy and fun. So we wanted to start by like using this little stage we have here to give attention to something that's not only a problem in the US, um, because in many, many parts of the world, people experience discrimination and violence because of their race, both by individuals and by institutions. And to us, that's simply not acceptable. So, First, we want to express solidarity with the protests in the US. And second, I also feel like I need to educate myself more on that topic and um, listen and learn about how I can better support Black people and people of color. And I'd like to invite you to do the same. So yeah, if you have any thoughts or resources you want to share on this topic, we'd be happy if you posted them in the state of the world stream on Zulip at any point. And for the white people among us, let's be very aware of our privileges um, today and also in the future. Thank you, Blinry. Um, that's very important also to me. So this event here is, is, is a space where we hope that uh, you all feel welcome also in these times. Um, 
we imagine it as a day to get together and to learn from each other, to get to know each other a little bit. Um, what I'll do now is give you a little overview um, of the day. So every year, uh, I'm amazed how large the vari variety of topics is that is proposed to us and um, that we can put into the schedules. Uh, we have set up a set of four, four blocks of four 10-minute talks each. Everything has to do with tech, but uh, many of them have connections elsewhere. Um, and this year is a bit special as our online event allows for international speakers uh, very easily. Um, so after lunch, uh, Nikki will join us for their keynote. To be honest, I'm really curious what Nikki will talk about because I don't know. Uh, at Enthusiasticon, we like to leave to the keynote speaker uh, what they'll talk about, but I expect it to be about um, community in general. Doing an online conference like this is still new for us as organizers and um, probably also for many of you. Um, so we want to ensure that you're, uh, so please, uh, we want to ask you to be even more careful and considerate um, than in the, yeah, uh, than compared to a live event. Um, just make sure that you take care of each other. I'd like to mention our code of conduct, uh, which I expect that you've already read if you're on Zulip. Um, if not, uh, please do so No. If there's a violation um, or anything you feel comfortable with and un uncomfortable with, or if you need to discuss something, you can always talk to one of us, one of the organizers, uh, or uh, we have different channels. You can also send an email to coc at enthusiasticon.de. And there's also a form on the COC webpage of enthusiasticon.de for sending it anonymously. Um, and I want to especially mention Nazreen and Joseph, who are our COC team. They will take care of the emails um, and make sure that every violation is handled. And they're also present on Zulip throughout the day and make sure everyone feels, feels well. Yeah, so for discussions during the event, we are using this like piece of open source software called Zulip. Um, uh, if you don't yet have access to that, if you're watching the stream and have no idea what I'm talking about, you can find a link to the registration in the description of the YouTube stream. And you're welcome to join us there. We will use it like to chat during the talks and to discuss some of the topics that are being talked about. Um, and if you are using Zulip for the first time, you might notice is it works a bit differently compared to other chat software, which you might be used to. Um, it has this top level concept of streams, which is what like other chat platforms might uh, call channels. And inside of that, for each message you post, you basically attach a little topic to the message, which um, is very similar to like a subject in an email, for example and which makes it really easy to like keep track of separate discussions going on at the, the same time. Um, that's a feature I, like after seeing that, I, I miss that everywhere else now. And we hope that you learn to like it as well. Um, Zulip has a lot of useful keyboard shortcuts. If you're into that, you can press the question mark key on your keyboard to find out about those. I especially like to use the N key to jump to the next unread thread. I think that's very useful. And yeah, we have set up some of the oh, some streams already. For example, there's the test here stream. You are not um, subscribed to that by default, but you can do so by clicking the add streams button in the sidebar, and then you will find it. And there you can just try out some of these fancy wild Zulu features. Mm, we have a talks stream where we can like discuss talks that are currently going on. Um, we have an introduction stream where you're welcome to introduce yourself if you want. Um, and we also have prepared a special stream which we will use during the breaks. Um, if you want to meet new people during the conference, you can join the random chats stream. And we built a little system where like during each break, basically, we will look at um, the people who are subscribed to that stream and we'll pair them together randomly and send them a private message. And then you can yeah talk a little bit and get to know each other if you 
a bit like that. You can unsubscribe from that stream at any point. And like the system will only look at the people who are subscribed um, like in the beginning of the break, basically. Um, yeah, and finally we have a meta stream, which you can use like if you have any suggestions on how to improve the event itself or the Zulip, um, we'd be happy if you post it there. If you have any questions about all of this, um, yeah, feel free to ask there, for example. You can also send a private message to organizers uh, to tap complete, and then you can reach all of us privately. And there's a similar group account for a COC team where you can reach Nesween and Joseph if you feel uncomfortable with anything. Right, that's everything about Zulip, I think. Also, um... An event like this, um, I guess it could happen, but it does not happen this time without sponsors. So we'd like to thank our sponsors for an event um, with uh, some idealistic values. It's always a tough decision from who to take money. Um, it's kind of like organized from us in our free time. So, but we did we decide we did decide though to have a small set of sponsors of which we are really happy with that they're supporting us. Um, especially, I want to mention Mozilla, our uh, major sponsor. Um, I personally like their community values. Uh, Vuga uh, would have hosted us in their event space in Berlin. Um, that didn't happen, but nevertheless, they're supporting us today. Uh, the sponsors, uh, also, also Sulip, um, Sulip, who are hosting us uh, for free. Thank you. Um, the sponsors make it, for example, possible that we do have real-time captioning, something I'm really excited about. Um, even though we're a small event, it's important to us to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we are really, really lucky that Mirabai, uh, our captioner, agreed to join us because they're waking very, very early for us. It's, I guess, uh, must be 4 a.m. now in their time zone. Um, you can find the real-time captioning below the stream on our website. If there's something uh, wrong with the delay, we're, we're currently uh, looking at it, and you might have to refresh the page uh, if we change the delay, um, such that this uh, takes an effect. Um, so that's the end of my uh, of our welcome. Um, so. I would like to ask all of the organizers to, to join StreamYard if they want to and introduce themselves quickly or say hi. 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 Look forward to having a conference with you all. Okay, I'm Joseph. I'm uh, I'm joining from Poland, and I'm re really looking forward to today. Thank you. Um, so now to the first speakers. Uh, now to the first speaker, the first block of speakers. I want to mention that we anonymized the proposals, um, and now we have a talk about pretty colors and what the secrets that they have. And hey, Blinry, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm a bit surprised by that myself. <laughs> right, sure. Let me show you my screen. Right. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about gamma correction. Um, if you've probably seen like, um, color pickers, RGB color pickers, like look kind of like this, right? Where you like pick a number between zero and 255 for the red, green, and blue channels to define how your color should look like. And um, I want to look at an even simpler version of that. That's just the, like the brightness picker for grayscale values, basically. Um, where like at the very left part, we have a brightness of 0%. And at the right part, it's as bright as the screen can display 100%. And now my question is, um, what do you think the brightness is for the color we pick from the, exactly the middle of this, this slider? And until two months ago, I would have said, of course, it's like 50% as bright um, because to our eyes, it kind of looks like that, right? But it turns out that it's only a brightness of 21%. 
and I found out about this and I said, what's going on here? Um, I was super confused and went into this deep rabbit hole um, and found that it's, yeah, about this thing called gamma correction, um, which I had heard of before, right? Like I thought it was something to do with like old CRT monitors and no longer relevant today. But turns out that this is super relevant today and it's in all our screens and all of our files and that knowing about it can kind of help you each time you're working with pixels. And I wanted to share that with you. So um, let's look at our grayscale slider again and like measure all the brightnesses for all of the colors we have in there. If we do that, we get a curve that looks like this. So especially like for the first third of the brightness values, they are pretty close to zero actually. Huh? which is also surprising to me because like we can definitely see a difference in there. And this is just because of how our human eyes work. Yeah, we are really good at differentiating between like darker shades of lightness because that's useful to be able to see at night, for example. And for bright values, we don't care as much. Well, it's bright. Yeah. Um, just to compare that with like the situation where we would build a, a, a gradient that's linear in the brightness, it would look like this. And here, yeah, again, mm, we don't get a lot of dark colors, but we get a lot of brighter ones. And if we think about we, yeah, that on the slider, we only have numbers from 0 to 100, 255 to describe each of our pixels. It makes sense like to pick um, a wider range of colors that like express better what our eyes can see, right? Compared to the right case. So this curve kind of makes sense to have. Um, and now we can think about which, which function is this curve, right? It kind of looks like the right half of a parabola, like x squared, right? And it's pretty close to that actually. It's um, x to the power of 2.2 which is just, yeah, it, it best matches what our eyes do. Um, and if people talk about this exponent 2.2 in the, in, in the context of colors, they often call that exponent the gamma. So that where that comes from. Um, and also this curve has been standardized. Um, in the 90s, HP and Microsoft made a standard called sRGB, which is for standard RGB. Um, and it does two things at the one, side it describes like precisely how these color channels should map to frequencies which is also super fascinating mm, and the second thing is that they like describe this curve for converting the number describing a pixel to brightness on the screen um, so this is what every monitor you have probably ever used is doing yeah when you send a pixel value to it it will do this conversion no matter if it's a crt monitor or more modern LCD, and even printers do this. They follow this standard. Mm. So now you might be thinking, okay, so why should I care about all of this? How is this helpful to me? Um, let's look at like the consequences of this. Um, we said that if we have an image stored on disk in a in a file, an image file, um, the numbers in there do not directly correspond to brightness. And to display them on a screen, we kind of have to take those values to the power of 2.2 um, to, yeah, to calculate its actual brightness. This is the step called gamma correction. And this is also what printers do. And the flip side is that if you like have a camera which like directly measures physical brightness and you want to store a pixel uh, to a file, um, you kind of have to um, do the inverse. Yeah? So you take the physical brightness and take it to the power of 1 over 2.2. That's like an inverse gamma correction. And this is because we know that the monitor will correct it again later. And again, this setup makes sense. This is really good to have because it allows us to make more efficient use of like what the numbers we have available for describing pixels um, do. It's more expressive in the, the terms of lightnesses we can see. So now I'm, 
I, I don't assume that um, many of you will um, build like screens or printers or cameras on a daily basis. But what you might do um, is like doing Im image operations, taking an, Im an image and doing some filter effect on it, for example, like blurring or mixing it with something else. And in this situation, it's really good to know about this, yeah? that the number stored in a pixel is not the actual brightness. And if you want to do anything with the actual brightness, you have to do this gamma correction first. Then you can do your calculations. And then you need to like do the inverse to store it back in the file. I will show you an example of that later on. And the second case where it comes in useful is if you are creating an image from scratch, like because you're making a 3D rendering, for example, where you're also calculating with actual physical brightness values. And then to be sure that that displays correctly, um, you need to do this inverse gamma correction to store it in the file in sRGB space, right? Um, so to show you an example for like an image processing step where it's good to know about gamma is when we want to mix two colors together. Um, until two months ago, I would have said, okay, let's just take those colors, like the values per channel, and just add them together and divide by two to get the average kind of. Yeah? And if you look at the resulting gradient, um, you get a mixture that looks kind of like this. So like, it's not really pleasant. You get this dark, darker spots here, and then it goes through this brownish, dark green phase to go to the brighter green. This is not what physical light would do. Yeah? And now we can kind of apply our knowledge about gamma to this and say, okay, those two colors we picked, like we got them from color pickers, and so they are in sRGB space. They do not correspond to, to lightness directly. So first we need to do gamma correction on them to get their physical brightness. Then we can mix them together. And then we can store back the result into the image. Um, and the resulting gradient we get when we do this is much more pleasant to my eyes. Yeah, it's it doesn't have this darker problem. It stays at even brightness. It even like goes to them some orange, and it's nice. Um, so okay, I didn't know about this um, until recently. Do you want to know who else didn't know about this? Um, Photoshop. Um, if you like take a red background and draw on top of it with a, like a soft green brush, you also get this ugly dark artifacts at the places where the two colors mix. Um, that's at least the default setting. Yeah? If you go to the color settings and then check a little box called blend RGB colors using gamma, um, also yeah, recent versions of Photoshop will do this correctly and mix them in a much more pleasant way. Um, do you want to know who else didn't know about gamma? The CSS standard, which is used to like style how websites are looking. Um, if you do a gradient using CSS, um, you will also have this problem that you, you're not doing it gamma correctly. And I found this discussion from 2012 where someone pointed this out and the response was basically just, mm, yeah, everyone else is doing it like that and our gradients should just match. So this was never changed, which is a pity because if you know about this and like calculate the, your brightnesses correctly, you can get such pretty results. At the right, we see like a, a rendering, a 3D rendering where gamma correction is applied. And it looks much more realistic compared to the uncorrected case. Um, so yeah, if you take one thing away from this presentation, um, I would like it to be that, yeah, if you have an image stored on a file, the numbers describing the pixels do not correspond to brightness. Um, they are a bit too bright. Yeah, you have this, they are in this sRGB space. They are numbers from zero to 255 usually. And they are just, yeah, built in a way, like the, the conversion we will do is built in a way so that we can make more efficient use of the options we have. Um, yeah, and better match what I, our eyes could see. And if you want to do any kind of operation on it, um, you have first to do gamma correction by taking the value to the power of 2.2. Then you can calculate with brightnesses. And then you can store back the result later. And if you do the gamma correction, you are like in a linear RGB space where like the numbers really mean physical brightness. 
And in that space, it's best to use to work with flows, uh, to be precise. And after that, convert back. And that's all I got. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Blinry. I learned something new today about, I think it's a path dependence of using colors. I don't know. Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, next up, or let me let me just, uh, we, we learned from our um, Paragon, <laughs> BangmanCon, that it's, that it's a good, um, good way to uh, fill some time in between uh, the talks that you all can switch the channel. So I quickly like to mention um, the talk stream maybe, um, where we sorted the talks um, by, we, we kind of put square brackets in front uh, for the block numbers uh, and then they're not sorted. So basically you have to look out for the right block number that we are in now. For example, the next talk is B1. Um, what is a digital photo? So I quickly comment in it here. Uh, go on and comment uh, this talk. Um, but I'm basically just filling a bit of time that you have time to find the right stream and uh, switch. But you could have let Fabian in. Sorry uh, for the confusion. Fabian, hi. hi. <laughs> so let's introduce Fabian Tan, um, who is a software engineer, uh, likes photographing and hiking and is currently uh, residing in Berlin, as far as I understood. Yes. Um, and the, the title of his talk is, what is a dig digital photo really? Um, I'm curious to find out. The stage is yours. Cool, thanks. Um, have you ever used a film camera before? Um, I really like film cameras because you kind of have to get involved in the mechanics of how they work just in order to use them. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, when you start taking photos of the film camera, first you need to buy a film, um, and then you need to load it into the camera. Once you've done that, you can actually take your photos. So then, once you've taken 36 photos, you wind the film back into the, uh, back into the canister and eject the canister from the camera. Then you have something that looks like this, and you take it to a development lab, and you say to the person behind the counter, hi there. This canister contains 36 of my most precious memories. Could you please convert them into something that I can use again? Uh, if you phrase it like that, they'll probably think you're a bit of a strange person, but they'll probably still take your film and your money, and then in a week or so, you'll have some negatives. What I really like about this process is that there's a really clear metaphor for the fact that something magical is happening. There's like a transformative process. You hand someone one thing and get back something completely different. And so after my second or third film, I started to wonder if there's a similar kind of magic going on in digital photography as well. You see, digital photography is kind of strange because you just push a button on a camera and then you get a JPEG on an SD card and you're done. Um, but it turns out there's a lot of complexity underlying that. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Let's start by talking about sensors. Um, this is an extreme close-up photo of the sensor from a Nikon D600 camera, which was released in 2012. Um, and each of these comfortable looking pillow things is called a photodiode. Um, photodiodes are capable of converting light into electrical signals. And so if we then hook that up to an analog to digital converter, we end up with a binary representation of the light that was falling on the photodiode. If you do that 24 million times, you have a 24 megapixel image. It's kind of that simple and also entirely not that simple. Um, a source of complexity, for instance, is that this doesn't know anything about color. So if you want to be able to capture color with a sensor, you have to employ some shenanigans. And by far the most commonly employed shenanigan is called a color filter mosaic. Uh, the idea here is that if you took a tiny piece of glass and colored it in, and then laid it directly over each of these photodiodes, you can effectively change the or limit the colors of light that are picked up by each of these photodiodes. So if you color them such that only blue light goes through or green light goes through or red light goes through, you end up with blue pixels or green pixels or red pixels. Now, there's no reason why we have to use these colors specifically. Um, and there's also no reason why we have to use this two by two grid layout like in this diagram. Um, this is just the most common one. It's called a Bayer filter. Uh, another one that I've seen before is this Fuji X-Trans one, which is in some of Fuji's most recent cameras. That's like an entirely different layout. 
And the shades of red and blue and green are all slightly different as well. By this point, you might be wondering, hang on, I've heard you talk about pixels as if they're red or green or blue a bunch now. And I could have sworn that pixels were red and green and blue. Um, whenever we work with color, as software engineers, we're used to thinking of pixels as having all three of these components. Um, but actually, pixels don't really exist in reality. They're an abstraction. Um, the whole point of them is that they mean that we don't have to think about the differences between how different kinds of input hardware or different kinds of output hardware are implemented. Let's talk about screens briefly. Um, so screens use different pixel layouts depending on the technology that's being used for a screen. Here's a few examples. Each of these all have red, green, and blue lights comprising each pixel. But when we talk to the screen, we just say, hey, make this blue or make this orange. We don't have to worry about turning on or off or the brightness of each of these individual lights. And that's a really nice property as, as software engineers or engineers generally. We're trying to avoid thinking about problems as much as possible. Unfortunately, this abstraction means that we do need to think about this problem when it comes to digital imaging, because we're missing some of the color from every pixel. And we can fix that using a process called demosaicing. Um, now, demosaicing is an interesting process, and it's also really foundational. Because we're so used to working in RGB pixels for everything else, you really need to get this right in order for the rest of the image processing steps in like a digital camera pipeline to, to look good. It's that whole garbage in, garbage out thing from data science. Um, now, having said that, what we're going to do today is demosaic an image using a really, really naive approach. Do not use this in production, but it was really easy for me to write, which is the reason why we're using it today. Cool. So let's start with a photo I took sometime last year. Um, this is a digital photo. What I've done here is colored each of the individual pixels captured by this sensor with the corresponding color from the color filter array of the camera that took the photo. Um, this just makes it easy for us to, to think about the image. These pixels don't actually have any color by themselves. At this point, they're just numbers. Um, so now what we're going to do is consider each channel separately, red and blue and green. So we can see that these are the red pixels in the image. Now we've got a whole bunch of other pixels that don't have any red. And so we'll need to give them some kind of red value. We're going to take a super naive approach now and just copy it from the closest other red pixel that's around. Um, and then we get something that looks like this. It's not perfect, but hey, it, well, we'll see if it works. Um, we can do the same thing for blue. And we can do the same thing for green as well. And then if we composite all of these layers together, then we get this. Um, it's not yet immediately clear if this is correct or not. So you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, but in the meantime, pay attention to this color fringing that's happening on the outside. There's like a purpley kind of thing going on on the edges of this photo. Um, we'll come back to that later. But yeah, at this point, it's not, I mean, you might be thinking that this could be a problem, but ultimately, um, this is a tiny, tiny tree way off in the distance. Um, so it's really, really, really not a big deal. Where it does start getting important is if we start doing other work to the image. Um, so let's change tact a little bit now and talk instead about what some professional image editing software is doing instead of the thing that I wrote. Um, here is the same image rendered with Lightroom instead. Another Adobe product. We're not trying to be mean to Adobe today. They make very good things. Um, Lightroom is, is what I use when I actually want my photos to look good. And the first thing you might notice is that the colors are popping a lot more, and that uh, also that the image has deformed slightly. So the reason why the color and contrast is so good is because Lightroom automatically applies a tone curve, which actually is required to make the image look good. Your digital camera will do this as well. Um, the stuff that comes out of a digital camera sensor is just kind of linear and flat. And so you really need to apply this transformation. The deformation on the edges comes from the fact that my specific camera is embedding information about the lens in use and the optical deformities of the glass in the lens, which I think is really cool. And then Lightroom is then reversing that process a little bit to try and produce something that's a little more true to reality. Um, so these are much more significant improvements than the, than the demosaicing thing that we were just talking about. But let's talk about demosaicing again. 
this was the thing that we had from the very, very naive implementation that I'd done before. Um, and this is what you get out of Lightroom. You can see that the color fringing isn't there anymore. This is a much clearer line. These things are actually vaguely tree colored consistently and sky colored. There's no rainbow. Um, but this whole talk has secretly been about abstraction. And so I want to return to that theme a little bit and about a place where the abstraction breaks. Because it looks like this is the perfect RGB representation of the input data. But if you start turning up the sharpening, you get these lines. Um, and these are affectionately known as wormies in the, in the Fuji photography community. Uh, not so affectionately, actually. Um, so it kind of looks a little bit like an impressionist painting. And what's going on there, I think, is it's some kind of interplay between the specific sensor layout that's in use and the demosaicing algorithm, and then the sharpening algorithm. There's some kind of negative feedback loop in there that's creating this effect. Um, what it means is you get a whole bunch of people asking on the internet, why does my picture start looking like Starry Night when <laughs> I start turning up the sharpening? Um, so what I find interesting about all of this is that it's very clear that the software that you use and the algorithms you choose affect the aesthetic qualities of the image. Um, and in that sense, it's kind of a little bit like film. Um, there's some films that are obviously better than other films, but it's not like the perfect film for every situation is the same. Um, because sometimes photography is about having the perfectly crisp image. Sometimes it's about having something that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and sometimes it's just about fun. So what is a digital photo really? I guess the answer kind of depends on the labels you apply. Is it 24 million numbers? Yes. Is it a representation of reality at a specific point in time? Also yes. And is it totally dependent on the way you define a pixel and a color? Yep. Um, it all depends on your level of abstraction. Thank you, Fabian. Applause, applause. <laughs> it's a bit weird that I have to applause on my own. <laughs> um, to give you a bit of uh, time for context switching, I um, want to uh, talk a little bit about curries, just something random that comes to my mind. I improvise now. <laughs> I have some vegetables in my in my fridge, and I'm really procrastinating to uh, to uh, <laughs> to currently prepare them. And uh, so, if you want to talk to me about uh, curry recipes, uh, feel free on the chat. Uh, I have some. Um, what do I have? Zucchini? Uh, is that the right word? I don't know. Um, and also celery, for example. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> I uh, I learned in the last talk about um, like these little pixels. I, I really have to uh, watch that talk again because I, I'm currently very um, switching between between contexts here uh, as a as a moderator, um, and I think we could be ready for for the next talk. I quickly um, announce it on on Zulev that we have the right stream. So uh, the talk title. Um, no, first let me. Uh, Chris, can you uh, put Naomi in the stream? I will introduce Naomi, who is. A software engineer, hi Naomi, and uh, entrepreneur, and also um, uh, has done a lot of projects in the uh, AI uh, fields, and um, is a founder, and also seems uh, like is a professional speaker actually. Um, so <laughs> I um, hope. Uh, you have fun at our little conference. And um, I'm really excited for the talk about AI explainability. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm just getting used to the buttons here on my computer. So uh, explaining artificial intelligence explainability in 10 minutes or less. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, my name's Naomi Freeman, and I'm here today because I'm enthusiastic about explainability in AI. Uh, you can find my Twitter at Naomi underscore Freeman. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. Well, that's quite the proclamation, isn't it? 
But we do get that sense and feeling, don't we? That the future is made up of computers smart enough that we don't need to take care of a bunch of tasks we're rather bored of taking care of. It's the final frontier. Robots do the heavy lifting. So for those who aren't as familiar with AI, um, many artificial intelligence apps today follow this kind of process here, these supercomputer robots we want, right? A programmer creates a model, and in there we have some assumptions and some training. Uh, we run some input through it, and we get a magic answer. Is this a dog or a cat in a photo? Cat. Do I have the flu? Absolutely. Um, inside of that, we can say there's sort of three particular models of AI currently in use. The first involves really some machine learning and a lot of human checking, adjustment, and intervention. The computer's making predictions, say, about your mastery of a subject in a test, but a teacher needs to go in and manually check everything and adjust some of the machine's answers. This is, in fact, training the AI model, but with human supervision. The second involves much more machine thinking and much less human intervention. The program is pretty good at sorting things, like many of our visual classifications, for example. Computers are pretty good at saying, this is a dog or this is a cat, and humans kind of just check that it makes sense at the end and sign off on the results. The third model of AI is the penultimate standalone AI. This is where businesses want to get today. The computer does all of the thinking, processing, predictions, and produces accurate answers and results. No humans needed. Presumably, this will save us a lot of money. Hurrah! No people. More money for big core. Uh, hold up. <laughs> Enter GDPR, um, the general data protection regulation that EU has adopted. In our lovely GDPR documents, we find Article 22 concerning automated individual decision making, including profiling. Section 1 of Article 22 reads, the data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal or other significant effects on him or her. So this law in fact states that you are not allowed to have the penultimate fully automated AI system. So if we think about an example, we can think about loans. Say you submit an online application requesting a small loan to build a new fence in your yard. In this traditional model, you request the loan, the program shakes all the input around in a magic black box and spits out an answer. Nope. The GDPR is protecting consumers from bias, discrimination, and generally inaccurate or underdeveloped AI decision making by banning this kind of model. But we're getting pretty good at AI, don't you think? Well, maybe not. This visual classification sincerely believes this cat is a toaster, 98% accuracy, bang on. So we're accurate maybe 64 to 68% of the time overall when it comes to all AI accuracy ever. Home antibody tests for coronavirus are also running around 70% uh, accuracy on tests right now. Would you take that risk with knowing if you have coronavirus or not? And uh, false positives with coronavirus are even worse than the antibody tests. I mean, you could take a, a look at these numbers and investigate them more on your own. So the challenge here is we end up with prediction with no justification, which has serious implications in areas like health, finance, and law. Experts in these areas simply cannot accept prediction with no justification. So the idea of adding a layer of explainability is revealing how these predictions and results are arrived at. We begin with our model and then programmatically capture and reveal data inputs and predictions. We can then gather these into an explanation layer, which we reveal via a UI to the end user. The end user is then able to look at the data, the model used, the explanation for the prediction, and make an informed decision about what to do with the results. So with explainability layers, we reveal assumptions and data input, evaluate it, and weighed. And then we can decide if these factors are even factors we need to think about when making our decision. So for here, in this example, we're looking at, is this a good house if I run it through an app? And the app says, great, but maybe for us, a good house is seven kilometers away from any schools, contains no dog parks, and is two stories high. Who knows? None of this information is really relevant to that. Medical and legal professionals similarly require this kind of information from our AI to understand if it's even useful to the problem at hand that they're solving. So, a working definition 
of explainable AI is humans being able to easily comprehend through dynamically generated graphs or textual descriptions, the path that the artificial intelligence technology took to make a decision. Programmatically, to build our explainability layer, we really need three core components. Significance weighting for variable value tandem, both negative and positive. So in our house example, what is the most significant factor in increasing a house price? Parks, we need to weight it accordingly as we go through our network. We also need the least significance to avoid dragging the model the wrong way. We'll need a loss function, which we're gonna look at in one second. And then we need to have some results uh, output in a simple text, visual, or chart format. So what do we need this loss function for? In the neural network, you'll have a, a loss function anyways, but your explainability layer needs its own loss function. So if you think about it, an AI model may have something like 40 or 50 nodes of information and output available. Typically, we'll tell it to only give us the top three or the one that has the single most, uh, the highest probability of being true. With the explainability layer, though, you'll need to build an algorithm to balance how much the model knows against how many options the end user is presented with as points of explainability. There becomes an inverse relationship here where the better the explainability to a human, the less faithful you actually are to the original model. And we can express this with a loss function. If you want to start playing around with AI and explainability, I can recommend this stack. Now, of course, you can build everything on your own from the ground up. Absolutely, it's a thing. Um, but if you just want to get going, Google TensorFlow and Keras layers to set up your model. MNIST datasets. They have a huge range of visual and non-visual datasets available free for use. Um, in this example, where I'm thinking of this stack, I'm using Python and making use of pandas and NumPy to be able to manipulate data and transform it into more readable formats. Scikit-learn can provide visualization in the form of charts and graphs. And then IBM's new Lale framework with Lime for explainability. So Lale extends Scikit's capabilities and Lime actually can provide plain text explanations. And for me, this was a super exciting discovery because um, I'm often working in nonprofits or I'm working somewhere where, you know, there's some technical knowledge, but not a lot. The technical knowledge gets concentrated. And Lime offers explanations that non-data scientists can actually make use of. Woohoo! let's bridge business and tech and get this stuff going forward. This is exciting for me. <laughs> So just to summarize kind of what we've gone through, at the moment, um, where we're at with many commercial apps is this kind of model here. From perfect weight loss to checking if you have the flu, you download some app, it takes some input, uh, shakes it around in a magic box, and tells you something. And when you take this app to someone like a doctor, they dismiss the data completely because it's not sound. With an explainability layer, we're moving to something like this. Uh, adding the explainability layer programmatically, we use a UI to reveal decision making involved, and this allows the decisions in the app to be defensible. It extracts statistical probability of each element and can reveal the weights and biases involved, as well as the model as a citation if we so wish to add that. Building in this way with the revealed explainability adds a new tool to say doctor's pockets. They now have access to the mechanics, statistics, decision-making models, and can build their own decision-making from that foundation. Happily, it also gets around your GDPR challenge. So, you know, AI will not replace doctors, but instead will augment them, enabling physicians to practice better medicine with greater accuracy and increased efficiency. And this is true of all professions. To best make AI useful to regulated professions, we need the AI to be defensible. And we could do that with explainability. So that's why I'm so excited about AI explainability. We can only go as fast as our slowest team member, and this explainability brings us all forward. Thanks so much for listening, and would love to chat with you more. Thank you, Naomi. I... I'm really glad that there uh, are regulations um, uh, and laws that kind of try to uh, deal with the, with the problems that we have in AI. 
and thank you for explaining AI explainability. <laughs> I feel like um, we have we are a bit ahead of time, um, and I wonder how what could I tell you? Um, so maybe just um, let me tell you about uh, something. Um, when, when organizing a small conference like this, it's always a question uh, where, uh, how do you, how do you spread the word? Like, how do you um, find out uh, how, how we have a lot of, we have a lot of people here. Um, how do you, how do you get proposals? For example, if you're, if you're not known um, and we're kind of like writing on the back of um, some communities, for example, um, I want to mention the recurse center and um also there are like platforms um if you're organizing a conference and wondering about that uh, there are platforms like speakerinnen.org um that you uh where you can basically write to people uh and say hey why uh why don't you come to our conference and i think that's a that's a good way to try to reach out to as many communities as possible also um there are like Berlin communities that we try to reach out to, um, which uh, is, for example, the Heart of Code um, community, or um, basically tell your friends. That's also like with a word of mouth thing, right? I'm kind of surprised that every year uh, we have around the same number of people. So currently I see 60 people in the stream, and that is also around the number of people we had um, in the last two years in the live events at Berlin. Um, so that was about one minute, I guess. Um, the next talk is up by, by Gargi. Hey, Gargi. Um, Hi. oh, yes. Um, is there something? Um, I can share it again. Uh, uh, sorry. I was confused by the, by the stream. Um, so, Gagi, uh, you're a software engineer uh, who is into sy uh, systems programming, uh, which we've already already seen last year at EnthusiasticCon, where you talked about uh, uh, some um, Linux kernel um, retracing, right? Um, so, uh, I'm looking forward to your talk, um, which is about printing floating numbers, which seems to be surprisingly hard. Have fun. Uh. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my talk is printing floating point numbers is surprisingly hard. Um, so this is probably something most of us are aware of. So if you have the Python wrapper or the Haskell wrapper or the OCaml wrapper or literally most of the wrappers and you write 0 0.1 in the wrapper, then you get 0 0.1 as the output uh, on the screen. If you write 0 0.2 as the wrapper, then you get 0 0.2 as the output on the screen. And if you write 0 0.1, and if you add 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, then you get the output of 0 0.3 and a whole lot of zeros and four. And which is confusing, right? Because I mean, this is this is not hard. Adding 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 doesn't seem that hard that even in 2020, like the wrapper can give us the right answer. So uh, I wanted to dig in deep into this as to why this still happens. And there's, it's a, uh, and there's a lot of, and there was a lot to discover. So humans love decimals. So if you have 0 0.25, you can just represent it as 25 into 10 raised to the power minus two. And computers love binary. So if you, and if you again have 0 0.25, then you have a binary re representation per 0 0.25. And converting decimal number to binary is simple for integers because it's a limited range. So each integer maps to a binary number. But uh, it's surprisingly hard to do that for uh, but it, it, that's not the case for floating point numbers. So there's only one way compatibility for floating point numbers. So uh, each 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 binary number has a corresponding each binary floating point number has a cor corresponding decimal representation. But each decimal floating point number doesn't necessarily have a binary representation. So if you 
if you so this is the IEEE 754 floating point standard for uh, getting the binary representation for uh, for a floating point number. So you have a sign bit, you have a few bits for exponent and a few bits for mantissa, and then you use the, like this formula to get back the floating point number. And if you wanted to represent 0 0.3 as the IEEE 754 standard, when you convert it back, you get 0 0.3004882825, which is not the exact number, which is not exactly 0 0.3, and that's the problem. So one of the things that all the so one of the things that all the algorithms that print floating point numbers focus on is correctness. So I have a range. So where in the range from v minus to v plus, all the numbers map to 0 0.1. So the correct number to print in this whole range that maps to one one uh, that that maps to one a binary representation is to print the shortest number in this range. So the uh, I will now discuss a few algorithms that, there, that are there to print floating point numbers. And one common theme that connects all these algorithms, other than the fact that they're all floating, printing floating point algorithms, is that they're named after dragons which is, this is completely useless fact, but it's kind of funny, so I thought to add it. So uh, in math, there's something called a dragon curve, which is like a recursive curve that you draw by folding, folding a paper and rotating by 45 degree. So you fold and then you get a peak and you fold and then you get a peak. And those initials represent F and P, which is also a floating point number. And that's why a lot of, uh, all their algorithms are called, are, are related to dragons too. So the first algorithm is Dragon 4, which came around in 1990s. So computers have already been around for a few years now. And still the first algorithm that came was in 1990 by Steele and White. So this algorithm des uh, describes four criteria that you need, uh, that the algorithm should satisfy. So one is information preservation. So if you, um, if, you, uh, if you print a floating point number and you read it back, then you should get the same answer every time. It is minimum length so that you don't have extraneous digits that you don't need. It's correctly rounded. And Dragon4 actually generated the floating point number. So when you generate the floating point number, you generate it from left to right. Um, so a very high level overview of how Dragon4 worked was that you can imagine you have a painting brush like sweeping through this whole range that maps to one integer. So from V minus one to V one, you sweep this with like a paintbrush. And then in this range, you decide that whatever is the, whatever is the shortest number is the number you're going to print. So there was, uh, uh, Dragon 4 was 100% correct all the time. So uh, every, time it, uh, every time you use this algorithm to print a floating point number, you would get the same, uh, and read the floating point number again, you would get the same answer. But the problem, the kind of, the problem with this was it uses, it used big int arithmetic. So like not machine integers, but integers that like defined using software and because of which it was relatively slow. Um, the next algorithm came around 20 years after 1990. So in 2010, Loisch uh, described an algorithm called Grishu 3. And Grishu is a dragon in one of the French cartoons, if I remember correctly. So this algorithm uh, came 20 years after the first algorithm, which because at the time it was thought that the floating point uh, problem is almost already solved. So yeah, I mean, that also, uh, also fascinates me. Um, so when you think of uh, Dragon 4, you can think of like a big brush, like, oh, sorry, a really small brush sweeping through this interval from A to B. Now, the problem with the small brush is that you can only, uh, you can only be so fast like you can't be fast enough to scan bigger intervals. 
so how Grishu solves this is you have a bigger brush, which means you can sweep the intervals faster. But the problem is when you get to the ends, you, it's, a, it's a bit blurry on the sides because you can, you can go out of the interval you're supposed to be looking inside. So with Grishu, what you want to do is you must cover the small range. So inside a, inside the range of A to B, you are sweeping the brush. And what might happen while sweeping this interval is that you might also cover the large range. So let's say if you let's say if you keep the brush inside these two, inside the inside A and B, then you have a narrow approximation. And when you're looking outside and when you're sweeping at the boundaries, you might have a wider approximation. So if, if the wide and narrow approximation match, it means that you looked, you looked in the correct boundaries and that's where the answer is supposed to be. That's where the shortest integer that you want to find is. But what might happen is sometimes you might have an uncovered interval. So in those cases, like Grishu cannot, Grishu cannot guarantee you that it will be correct and in those cases it falls back to um, falls back to dragon 4 so it's 12.5 times faster than dragon 4 and it uses big uh, it uses 64 bit integers so machine integers um, which is a significant uh, which causes a significant speed up and it's correct 99.5 percent of the times so the rest of the 0.5 uh, percent of the times when you end up in the uncovered intervals, then Grishu uses Dragon for as fallback. And the less algorithm that I'm going to be talking about is Ryu. So Ryu came around in 2018. So Grishu algorithm actually is used by JavaScript where everything is a floating point number. And Python uses like a modification of uh, Grishu because uh, these floating point algorithms are really complicated. And uh, Python like focuses on simplicity of the algorithms uh, it is implementing. So it implements a simpler version of the floating point num of Grishu. And this like Grishu is more, uh, and Rust uses Grishu and Grishu is like more adopted, is, is widely adopted floating point algorithm. And Ryu is new on the block and uh, it came around two years ago. So let's say you have uh, you have three. Oops, sorry. You have these three uh, floating point numbers, and you want to find out the correct representation. So the three, the four criterions from Dragon Four, which were information preservation, minimum left correctly rounded, and left to right generation. Like all these algorithms are still following these. For, uh, for criteria, except that here in Ryu, because we're not doing generation per se, we don't really care about the fourth criteria, but we still care about information preservation, having the minimum length of a floating point number as possible and being correctly rounded. Um, so in Ryu, you keep cutting off digits, uh, and then you look, look at the number, which looks like the upper bound, and you decide based on like if you want to round, uh, based on the rules of rounding up versus rounding down of which number looks correct and then you choose that number as the representation. So Ryu is faster than Grishu, almost three times faster and you don't skip digits one by one, you decide in groups to skip as many digits as you can and it uses only integer operations. Um, so one of the challenges of floating point, printing floating point numbers is there's two problems. There's the output problem where uh, you have to decide how to print the floating point number, but there's also the input problem where it's like, how do you convert the, convert the, uh, the floating point number to its binary representation? And all these, all these algorithms only focus on the output problem, not caring about the input problem. Uh, which also might which also might change a few things. Um, and yeah, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gargi. That was fascinating. Um, lots of facts to to digest. Uh, I I need a break on this. <laughs> um, we actually have a break now. 
Um, so this ends the first block, um, and we'll continue with the uh, with the uh, uh, next block at eleven forty uh, in uh, UCT plus two. And for the break, uh, we do have uh, at least one activity. Uh, we 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 kind of try to organize activities on Zulip, and uh, one activity would be the random chats. So we'll soon start a very little script that um, pairs everybody together in um, who is in the stream. So if you want to uh, be part of that on Zulip, um, join the stream. Um, and then you get reminded, if you don't want to be part of it anymore, then you have to leave the stream. Our script is really, really simple. Um, so looking forward to chatting to you. and. See you again in 20 minutes.
Hi, welcome back. We hope you had a good break. Um, let's continue with our program. Um, I'm glad to announce the next speaker, um, Isla Carson, um, who finished a master's degree on bioinformatics last year. Um, and she like um, looked at a very special kind of source code um, inside of the human body, right? So um, I'll I'll see whether whether Alice ready. Sure, we we we'll need to we need a short moment. The, the title of Alice's talk is um, "Sorting the World's Largest Jigsaw Puzzle: Whole Genome Sequencing." And I think we can get started. Enjoy. Hi, um, so I am going to get, first give you a little bit of biological background because I'm guessing most of us here are on the computer science side of things. Um, so the genome, it, you can think of it as being the source code of life. It's our DNA. It provides us with the instructions that we need to operate on a cellular level. And the precise sequence of our DNA is interesting to biologists for a variety of reasons. Um, an example is to look for genetic diseases. Um, it's also applicable not just to humans, but to understand bacterial evolution, for example, or to sequence the latest virus that's running amok. So you might be asking, why is computer science involved in this? Well, we can't read genomes in the same way that we would read a book. We simply don't have the chemical capability to do so in an efficient fashion. So what we have to do is we take the genome, which in humans can be up to like is around 3 billion uh, base pairs long. So 3 billion uh, pieces of DNA long, which is A, C, G or T. Um, then we have to ampli amplify and fragment that. So what that means is we make multiple copies of the DNA and then we chop it up into lots of really small pieces. And these pieces can be as small as 100 base pairs long and once we've got there, we can then read them into what we call reads. Now, these reads generally have no locational origin that tells us where they came from in the genome. And so what we have here is essentially a jigsaw puzzle. Um, we have to take these reads and organize them back into the picture on the outside of the box or the genome. And in biology, there's a number of uh, differences compared to the normal jigsaw that you and I would maybe do. Uh, the first is that we don't always know what the picture on the outside of the box is. Um, other differences include just the sheer volume of data. We can have up to 200 million reads, so 200 million pieces. Um, we often have a lot of duplication, so there's pieces of the puzzle that are, we have many, many, many copies of it. And uh, we also can have errors in there as well that are introduced uh, by the chemical process. So how do we normally solve jigsaw puzzles? Well, if you're anything like me, then you're gonna sort the pieces first. So you'll look for all the edge pieces. You'll look for all the pieces that are mostly blue, all the pieces that are mostly purple and so on. And once you have that, then you're gonna wanna start matching the pieces. So in biology, we're not matching them by shape, but actually by overlap. So the question is, does this piece, does the end of this piece uh, match the beginning of another piece to some statistically significant degree? And if yes, we can say they belong together. And so today we're going to focus on sorting the pieces. And this is for a few reasons, one of which is that as a mathematician, it appeals to me a lot more because there's a definitive, absolutely correct answer to this problem. Whereas with the second part, matching the pieces, this is a much more of a heuristic issue. And there's many different ways of doing this, uh, which can all give you slightly different answers, each of which are arguably equally correct. Um, so in order to start the pieces, we need to decide what we're gonna sort them into. So we're gonna sort them into a dictionary, uh, into a suffix array, which you can think of as being a dictionary in which we list all of the words in alphabetical order alongside their suffixes. And the reason that we choose this particular data structure would be a whole you know, talk on its own. But in summary, it's memory efficient and it allows us to do linear time searching in terms of query word length and not database size. So to give you a little bit of a better idea of what that looks like, if we have two very short reads here, cat and tact, the next thing that we'd wanna do is we'd want to see what all the suffixes are, 
cat act t and then tact act and t for the second one there and then we'd want to sort them all in alphabetical order and that last bit there is what we're looking at um, that's the final product that we want it's a rep representation of it our main considerations here are storage and organization of the data and the choosing and sorting of algorithms now for the first part our main problem is volume so we need to decide how we're going to compress this huge amount of data and reference each suffix within the compressed uh, data format and then the second part we want to choose algorithms that complement the characteristics of our data and this is our focus today so what i'm going to show you is that by carefully choosing and lightly adapting some algorithms that you may already know we can solve this problem well enough to compete with other more complicated approaches in the research today. So in order to start strings, we first need to be able to compare them. And this isn't a unit time operation, it's dependent on string length. And in the worst case, we need to compare each, uh, each pair of letters one at a time. When we do this with a list of strings and permute them at each step into their sort order, we're performing a sort that's known as most significant di uh, digit radix sort. When we traver traverse from left to right like this, we also get a very natural bucketing of the data. So in the first step, each bucket contains all the strings that start with the letter A. In the second step, each bucket is further subdivided into strings that have the first two characters in common. And then we can use that information so that in the third step, we look at suffixes that are prefixed by a common substring of length four. And what's happening here is that each bucket is getting progressively smaller and that once a suffix is within a bucket, it never leaves it again. This means that we are not going to have any global sorting after the first step. And this is really good for speed because disparate memory access and writing is a relatively expensive operation. And it's also good because it makes it much easier to thread. But an important part of this process is how do we perform that sorting of buckets at each stage? How do we choose the best sorting algorithms? And the key here is to understand the data itself. So at the beginning, we're sorting by the first character only which is really easy to enumerate, as in the second step, when we're starting by the first two characters, we have one to four or one to 16. And this lends itself really well to sort kind. This is an algorithm for sorting, algorithm, for sorting items according to keys that are small integers. And the keys here are just the enumerated values of the characters or pairs of characters. So for the first, char the first um, chart there, we would have A is one, C is two, G is three, and T is four. Um, this works by counting the number of instances of each key whose ordering is already known and then using that information to sort the whole array. Now that we know the, sub, the ordering of all substrings of length two, we can use that information to sort all the substrings of length four and then use that to append a further four letters and then a further eight and so on. But as the length of the appending string increases, the number of unique possible substrings also increases and it does so exponentially which is something that we maybe all understand a little bit more than we'd like to at the moment. Um, luckily for us, genomic data is inherently structured. You can think of this, if you think of like the English language, for example, you would very rarely see ZZZ and you would pretty frequently see the letters AT together. And this means that we can cheat. We can hash the unique substrings that occur into a small number of integers, sort them, and then use count sort as we did before. And this is actually faster than using quick or merge sort on the same data. As we continue on that process, we get an extremely large number of potential options because one, the string length is growing, and two, we have a greater number of errors being introduced at a chemical level. But as we're dealing with suffixes, lots of the words that we're sorting are relatively short. In other words, when we try to append more letters to the end, we can't because we've reached the end of the read, of the read and there's, there's no more. So we can just stop sorting these buckets. And we only need to sort the remaining buckets. So due to the string length, it's likely that each of the strings in the remaining buckets are relatively unique within the data set. And that means that we can't use sort, we can't use sort count anymore. And we also can't, um, we can't use that hybrid that we were using before. Um, Luckily, our buckets are now really small, and so the cost for this is dramatically reduced. Um, so after implementing this variety of algorithms, I was able to run some tests and compare my results to others in the field. And we can see in red that this algorithm actually vastly performs others when threading is used, and it can compete otherwise, which you can see in purple there. 
And what's really exciting about this is that this is just a proof of concept algorithm. We don't really pay that much attention to how we are compressing the data, how we're reading the data, and also how to optimize the points at which we're switching beneath, between the algorithms. And if we were to do that, that should give us even better performance. Um, so yeah, this is a really exciting uh, area of research. Um, I'd just like to quickly acknowledge uh, the University of Copenhagen, this was thesis work, and also the Recurve Center who let me continue playing around with this for three months there. Uh, so thanks for listening, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have on the Zillow channel. Thanks. Thank you, Ida. That was super fascinating. It's always blowing my mind how like these four different bases can make up for so much complexity in biology. It was interesting to see about to learn about like how to approach that computationally. Um, between each uh, pair of talks, we will give you a bit of time to like context switch. So um, I'm just going to ramble about random things, I guess. Um, for example, we have been um, ask about how we are running this remotely and if we had like any challenges compared to doing it um, as an, in an in-person event. And it certainly like it did, did bring some new things we had to decide, right? Like for example, for the technolo technological platform we are using, um, we're using a system called StreamYard, which allows us like pretty easily to add people to the stream and their slides and stuff. And we are pretty happy with that. And we had to make some decisions on what to use for that, I guess. Um, in the beginning, we were kind of thinking about like using a regular video conferencing system. But yeah, this is working pretty well, I think. Um, and yeah, because we're doing this remotely, we also have less expenses, basically. We don't have to rent a venue. And unfortunately, we also cannot provide you with food. So I'm afraid in the lunch break, you need to do that yourself. And with that, I guess we might be ready for our next speaker. Um, anu Unikrishnan, hey, welcome. Um, anu has been doing research in quantum cryptography in the past few years, and um, is also at the same time really excited about programming. And I think we're going to hear about like the how to combine stuff with uh, has to do with, with physics with coding, right? The talk is called Tilts from Coding and Physics. Go ahead. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anu. Uh, thanks for having me. And thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Um, so I've been spending the past few years doing research in physics. Um, and I want to talk to you about some of the ways in which coding has helped uh, answer some of the questions that we've come across. So to start off with, why would physicists need to code? Um, a whole bunch of reasons like modeling complex systems to control experiments, to simplify annoying calculations, to do simulations like fluid simulations, um, to find numerical solutions if an analytical solution is hard to um, find, to optimize parameters and to analyze data, whether it be from telescopes or particle accelerators or all sorts of things. Um, so I haven't really done any of this, but um, I'm going to tell you more about my personal experiences and why I've needed to code. So the first story um, I have is writing code to hack quantum key distribution. Um, and before I get into this, I want to introduce the field that this comes under, which is quantum cryptography. Um, and this is basically cryptography that does not rely on how powerful our computers are or more specifically, how powerful our adversaries' computers are. Um, so we don't want to say, oh, just because a bad person might take 10,000 years to solve a problem, this doesn't mean our data is secure. Because we might have a quantum computer um, on, in our adversaries' hands, and this might mean that some problems are a lot easier to solve than we previously thought. And so um, we want a type of security that doesn't rely on any sort of computational assumptions. And so quantum cryptography just relies on the laws of quantum physics, which is our most accurate um, theory of physics so far. And it provides what we call unconditional security um, that is not dependent on any computational assumptions. So QKD or quantum key distribution comes under this field. 
And this is, here's what it is. It's basically a way for two people that we're gonna call Alice and Bob to agree on a key that they can use to encrypt and send secret messages over an insecure uh, communication channel that might have some eavesdroppers hanging around um, without assuming anything about how powerful the eavesdroppers computers are. So even if she has a quantum computer, we want their communication to be secure. So like I said, we can do this by only trusting the laws of quantum physics, by uh, encoding the key bits in quantum particles like photons. And this, by some fundamental laws of quantum physics, this means that if an eavesdropper tries to read what's encoded in these particles, um, Alice and Bob will know because um, any type of, if, if she tries to read this, then it will cause a disturbance in the system. So are we all done? Have we solved the problem of secure communication? We have not because in the real world, there's noise in our channels. And this means that um, an eavesdropper have in, in like making some disturbance in the channel will um, might be masked by noise. And so Alice and Bob need to do some further steps to finally agree on a secure key. And so these steps after the first key distribution step, they do some further steps called distillation and reconciliation. And so um, at the end of all of these steps, we want Alice and Bob to agree on a secure key that Eve really doesn't know anything about. Eve is our eavesdropper, by the way. So, um, how, so what we wanna do is kind of simulate all of these steps. And so I'll just tell you briefly what each of these does. So in the key distribution step, um, we're gonna model the key as a random string of bits. And we're gonna incorporate noise by flipping random bits. So going zero, going to one, and one going to zero, depending on how noisy the channel is. So at the end of the step, Alice and Bob will have keys, but they might be different from each other. In the key distillation step, they're going to split their keys into blocks and do some comparisons um, to distill out a more secure key. And finally, in the reconciliation step, they're going to um, narrow down where the errors are in the keys and correct these using some parity checks. So um, you might be thinking, well, they're actually revealing something about their keys in these steps. So even if they're not directly announcing what bits they have, they're still um, revealing some information. And if the eavesdropper is clever, she can try and figure out what they're saying and try and exploit this information to, um, to learn more about their key, which means it actually won't be secure anymore. And so we want to look at the combination of distillation and reconciliation and see how secure it actually is by writing code. So um, we want to really answer the question, how much of the key can the eavesdropper figure out? And so what we did was we first wrote some C code to simulate the whole protocol, all of these um, different stages, um, then some Python code as the eavesdropper to keep track of which key bits uh, she could figure out from what they say, from what Alice and Bob say. And finally, some more C code that actually corrects these bits that goes through and does the corrections that she can do. And we found out that she can actually figure out a whole lot about the key. And so this combination is really not very secure. And we couldn't have done this without writing code. So my second story is about um, how to use code to help solve optimization problems in quantum crypto. So um, we, a lot of the time we come across these types of problems, which are semi-definite programs. So this is basically an optimization problem over matrices. So it could be max instead of min. Um, and a lot of problems in quantum crypto can be formulated in this way. And this comes down to the fact that we care about finding the optimal cheating strategy of an adversary. Um, and a lot of the time, this boils down to a maximization or a minimization problem. So what's, um, so including in things like building secure versions of things that might sound like sci-fi, like quantum teleportation or computing. Um, so what's actually going on here is we're trying to um, solve for this unknown matrix alpha, which is a positive semi-definite matrix. And this means um, it's self-adjoint and its eigenvalues are all greater than or equal to zero. Um, and this P and Q here are some matrices and X is some value. And these are all things that we know and are specific to our problem. And trace just means the sum of diagonal elements. So 
um, what this is really doing is it's going through all the possible values of the elements of alpha that satisfy these constraints. And it's figuring out which values will minimize this trace of P alpha. And like I said, this pops up a lot in quantum crypto. Um, and so we want a way of solving these problems, which we can actually do in MATLAB. But we come across another problem, which is we need to know something more about the structure of alpha. Um, so specifically, we want to know which elements of alpha are actually equal to each other. And this is another set of constraints that we have to put into our um, SDP solver in MATLAB. Um, and so this can get really messy if we do it by hand, as I found out back in 2017, when I literally taped together pieces of paper and wrote out all the elements of, um, this was a 21 by 21 matrix alpha, but um, it could get even bigger. I got up to an 81 by 81 matrix, and then I remembered that I can actually code and I can make my life a lot easier. So I wrote some C++ code, uh, fed it in the rows and columns of alpha, and this is used to calculate all the elements of alpha. Um, some Python code, which goes through and simplifies all of this to the form that I wanted and figured out which elements are equal to each other, which is our constraints. And finally, plug all of this into MATLAB code and solve the SDP. And this ended up helping to build secure protocols for things like quantum teleportation and all sorts of other applications. The last thing I want to briefly mention um, is writing code to search for dark matter. And this is, I'm not an expert on this, it's something I did for like one summer internship, but I found it super interesting. So I'll just quickly tell you what, what went on here. Um, so dark matter is this really mysterious thing that accounts for 85% of the matter in our universe. And we still don't know what it actually is. Um, so some theories in particle physics give us what we call dark matter candidates or fundamental particles that we think dark matter might be made up of. So I was looking at one of these theories um, and this theory has a lot of free parameters or undetermined parameters. And what we wanted to do was um, find the values of these parameters that will lead to um, a prediction of the dark matter density that matches the value that we know from experiment. So this is really, we want to scan and over a high dimensional parameter space and find the regions of the values that we're looking for. And to do this efficiently, um, a grid search wasn't uh, good enough. So we used the Markov chain Monte Carlo method um, which basically um, scans through regions that will give us, the chain proceeds um, in a direction that will give us good values that we expect. And it doesn't waste time scanning areas of the space that won't give us the value that we want. And so we were able to narrow down our huge parameter space to regions that are consistent with this expected value of dark matter density. Um, so yeah, that's all I have time for, but thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Anu. Um, I love to see that photograph of you and the printed out matrix. <laughs> um, we have on our Zulip this meta stream, which you might have seen. And if there is anything you think could be better, if you're confused by anything, definitely feel free to post in there no matter how small it is. For example, um, Someone mentioned that, like in the in the opening remarks, we didn't actually introduce ourselves, which we definitely should have done. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind for for next time. Um, and regarding the the random chats, but I I I heard from one person um, that they didn't get a match. So if you like were in that stream but didn't get a match, also definitely let us know so we can look into that. Um, Right, let's see whether we're ready for the next speaker. Um, cool. Um, I'd like to introduce Jakob. Jakob Runge, hey. Hi there. Sure. Um, <laughs> Jakob to be here. enjoys fiddling around with computers and also fiddling around with like very special toys, right? Um, yeah. I don't have one, but I only have a, another cube here, but you have oh. this real Rubik's Cube and a lot of them. Maybe I can share some. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to, to learn about more about the, the underlying structure of that with the talk, Promoting the Cube. Have fun. All right. 
Here we go. Um, so I like Rubik's cube as cubes, as Blinry said, and I especially like fiddling with them and the mechanical feel they give me in my hands and how I, when I'm stressed and or have a hard time to focus, I can always grab one and fiddle and see where the colors go and twist. And that's very nice to feel and to touch. But there's one additional thing I quite like about these cubes. And it was visualized by Douglas Hofstadter uh, in, in his book, Met Met Metamagical Themas, uh, like this. So there's this whole question of where do colors go when, when you twist these cubes? Where, where, where does stuff get displaced to? And um, he writes every person that, uh, that kind of fiddles around with it, they, they tend to build up their own kind of little science around it um, or uh, they they often come up with a notation of how how to track what goes where and uh, yeah that that's that's a, a thing i like to explore and to see so it's it's about permutations in a way right uh, so the the question where does stuff go where do colors go how are they arranged differently and that's very fundamentally what permutations are about to have a sequence or arrangement of things that can be put into a specific order and um, so for example here we have a permutation of three things and in the first line, we have uh, each thing named. And in the second, we have where it goes. So in this case, the first thing remains in the first place. And the second and third things, they swap their places. So this is an, an example of a permutation of three things. And when we have a strict order or a, 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 an easy way to order our elements, we can also omit this first line and just write it in a one-line way to get kind of an overview. Um, Behind these permutations, there is the, the whole mathematical concept of the symmetric group, right? Uh, so you, you can write this as capital S index N, which, which says we're talking about the, the permutations of N elements. In this case, we're talking about 54 because we have three times, times three times six uh, colored labels on our cubes and we want to look where they go. Um, and with the group, there come certain constraints or, or laws or helpful things. And one, one is there, the, to have a group, you must have an identity. And for the cube, it's basically, you can just leave it as it is or, or do any, any, any shuffle that leaves it back in the, in the same position it's currently in. Um, and you can, you can do an inverse permutation, right? If you arrange things in a way, you can revert that way of arranging things. And that's very nice to have with the cube because that allows us to get back to where we were. So we like that about, uh, about permutations. Um, there, is, there is one caveat though, um, that is um, there are permutations that you could make by, by restickering your cube that, uh, that you can't reach by ordinarily rotating it, right? So you can, for example, you could make all middle faces red on it and it wouldn't help. Uh, it, you, you could normally not reach that point by rotating. Um, yeah. And the coolest thing in my mind about permutations is they combine. You can, you can uh, do two rotations after each other on a cube and you get a, a new permutation of your faces. Um, and you can, you can combine permutations into new ones and uh, and kind you, you kind of get this this uh, intricately linked structure of permutations that that to, to me feels really beautiful so so what I did was hey I, I want to put uh, my the colored uh, the colored fields on my cubes in an order and what I what I did was I, I made little little numbered labels and stick at them on the cube. And it's not important whether the cube below those labels is actually solved. The, the important thing is that I start stickering my cubes in the same uh, fashion and be consequent with that. Because then this allows me to easily track where everything goes, right? You can, you can twist a cube and you can easily identify, oh, my number 11 went there and, uh, and which numbers re remained in their places or changed with which, with, with which others. Um, yeah, and so excited from that, I thought, well, I want to track this right-hand uh, rotation, like rotating the right plane of this cube and see where everything goes. And um, with these example cubes, it was really easy, right? Now I could, I could just unfold this cube 
uh, as you can see in the lower left, and, and write down all these numbers into an array. And what I suddenly got was, um, was a very simple data structure that captures this whole rotation, but also can be used to, uh, to perform this rotation, right? I can, I can put in a, a cube with all its, its colors and use this permutation to see uh, which, with what kind of cube I would come up. Um, so this was very exciting to discover, and from but it's a lot of work to write down all these numbers. So what I what I thought was, hey, maybe we can get around writing down every permutation and just write a few. Um, so I thought, well, maybe orienting the cube, uh, getting the left uh, side to to the top or something like that could, can help me with this. And I can can we find a way to to generate more permutations from this, and. Um, so I wrote down a permutation for the x-axis and for the y-axis, and that that was when it clicked. Like we can combine these x and y per, uh, rotations to build a rotation on the z-axis. Like for example, here we on the the left cube will just do the the z-axis rotation, and the right hand uh, cube will rotate on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and uh, and inverse on the x-axis. And we we can we can see it, it comes up with the same cube, and so so we already got around writing our Z permutation. We don't need to to jot that down manually, and from that we can we can go towards rotating the front of our cube. Right? Um, we we only so far we we wrote down how to rotate the right hand side, but we can use uh, our Z rotation now to build a rotation for the front simply by rotating the front to the right rotating the right-hand side and rotating back again. So that works. And, and from that, uh, it's, it's just like one more step to get all of these rotations, right? It's, it's, uh, that, that was very, uh, like, like, like a lot of structure suddenly unfolding. And I, I was really excited about that when, <laughs> when, when it all came together, because now there was suddenly a lot of code that, that, that was just these very few lines, but in it was was really the the whole rotations of of uh, the whole re basic rotations you can do to such a cube, and it was all that was necessary basically to uh, to programmatically fiddle with this problem space, um, right? And and one one thing I especially liked about this is like every every constant defined here is itself just an array, right? It's it's not it's nothing more like nothing like a more complicated structure behind that. It just boils down to this very simple representation, which to me was very beautiful to see. Um, yeah, but, but now the basic permutations are one thing, but uh, solving a whole, this whole problem space or, or navigating that, it's, it's, very, it's a very big problem space. So it's, uh, it's probably, if you, if you want to do it manually, it's helpful to discover a way to um, to get there by by get an intermediate step basically, and let's for example take a talk about this example shuffle where we just rotate the left and downward facing sides of the cube, and we can also invert that shuffle right. We can we can go backwards and undo every rotation starting from the last one and going towards the first. And what we can do with this is we can visualize it again, and it looks somewhat like this, and. What we get is a is a rather jumbled up cube, uh, which which has one uh, one corner piece a bit exposed. And let's say we just go one step ahead and rotate our top now, right? We we still have a, a shuffle that we can easily undo because we uh, noted everything about it. And when we now undo our shuffle and then only afterwards un unrotate our top, uh, we get a we get a very interesting thing because normally. Um, Normally, to to unrotate this, we would first unrotate our top, right? But we we pulled it out towards the end, and the the strange thing we get now is is called a commutator. Like uh, there is there is very little structure that changed, and and it's it's just in in in, in a few points. So this can very nicely be used to explore. Uh, uh, and solve uh, uh, or get towards solutions for the cube. And what you can do with it, if you do it in a program, is you can have lots of it and have a whole factory of cubes that you can solve and use to paint stuff. And that was really exciting, and I'm very grateful that I could share that with you. Um, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, Thank you, Jakob. Your enthusiasm about this really comes across.
<laughs> and I think you also made some of the the animations yourself, right? Um, like all the of them. They, they're on GitHub as well, like in, in Blender files. And nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. So um, after this, there is a single talk coming up, and after that, we will do a long break. Um, and for that break, we have um, like we will continue doing the random chats, but he, we would also like to suggest an additional activity which we would like to try with you. So we can't really be physically together and like walk around and mingle and crock and everything like that, right? But we can try to have a virtual version of that. Mm, there is a platform called gather.town um, where you basically, it's it's a bit like a crossover between Pokemon and a video call. So you can walk around in a 2D space. And as you get closer to other people, you'll be able to hear them and to see them. And um, we will prepare like this little conference map um, where you can just try that with us and see how it goes. I have no idea how well it will scale. I think um, the website says it's for up to 50 people, which might work for us. But yeah, let's see. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, I think we're ready for our next talk. Um, our next speaker is Fight, Fight Heller. Um, and I actually met Fight um, at my very first Intellisticon two years ago. Do you remember Fight? Um, mm -hmm. um, Fight self-describes self as a technologist at large. And I always enjoy hearing his nuanced and deep perspectives on things. So um, the talk is titled, All I Have a Hammer, Now Give Me Your Nails. Take it away, Fight. Hi. I'm Fight, and today I want to talk about hammers and nails. Most of us have probably heard the old saying that uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's one of those polite ways in which we're telling our peers that they're doing something wrong. We have very many of those. The sentence didn't actually originate in computer science, though. It is often referred to as Maslow's Law or Maslow's Hammer, uh, paying tribute to a psychologist who codified that law in an article in the 60s, but it is probably much older than that. My cursory research for its origin pointed at least to the 19th century, but it's probably even older than that. My guess is that this is one of those things that we're handing down generation to generation. And we use it a bit as a truism, as something to avoid any argument, a phrase intended to burn the battleground of thought once and for all, if you will entertain my pathos for a second. And I keep coming back to that phrase because I usually hate generalizations. All our tools, be it languages or frameworks or interfaces, impose some form of order on our day-to-day -day existence as technologists. Some lenses are just more focused than others. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, is it always bad to submit fully to that lens? And in my quest to get a satisfying answer to this question, I at some point remembered another overused quote that shapes our thought, at least in certain circles. It's by Alan Perlis of Algol and Turing Award fame. And it reads like this, it is better to have 100 functions operate on one data structure than 10 functions on 10 data structures. It's historically been one of those phrases that slightly eccentric Lisp people use to rationalize the Spartan aesthetic of their programming environments. But these days, most of us don't use one data structure. We use heaps and queues and lists and stacks and trees and hash maps and hash array map tries with orange peels and crushed ice. So let's ask ourselves, what do we get if we try to make everything one data structure? I'm going to pick four languages that went down that route, more or less adhering to it. And I'm going to show some of their affordances and how they make some hard things simple. And I'm going to gracefully omit the times when they make simple things hard. The first one I'm going to talk about is the one I'm most familiar with, Lisp. Lisp stands for Lisp processing. And the proof is in the pudding. Everything in Lisp is a list, even the syntax. Let's look at an example. This uses more or less closure because I wanted it to be concise. Uh, it doesn't use any closureisms, though. For those of you who don't know Lisp, um, everything in parentheses is a list. 
So the definition, building a macro here, is a list as well. And this particular macro takes a bunch of arguments and builds another list. And this list will end up looking like an if statement, or rather it will be an if statement. And thus the macro and is just a representation of logical conjunction expressed in terms of if. And we work on the syntax the same way we work on data. Let's go to the language I'm second most familiar with, Smalltalk. Smalltalk is the grandfather of object-oriented languages, but it's a very active grandfather, still around and telling the kids to stay off his lawn so that he can enjoy the peace and quiet of a good development environment. And Smalltalk contends, in a good object-oriented language, everything should be an object. There are no primitives. There is no control flow. You get objects. And so in Smalltalk, true is a subclass of Boolean, and so is false. And both of them implement a function called if true, if false that takes two blocks. Uh, these blocks are kind of like callbacks or anonymous functions. And true will just call the true block, and false will call the false block. And anything doing any sort of logic will return either of those classes that you can send this message to. And everything just sort of works out OK. Trust me on that one. At this point, I should probably mention that it's fine not to understand the code examples. Let them wash over you. Let's look at two languages I'm less familiar with, Forth and APL. Those are the languages that I usually let wash over me when I see them. Forth is for up first, and it works on stacks. Everything is put on a stack, and all the operators uh, operate on things on that stack. And everything happens from left to right always. My fourth example actually implements comments. Comments start with an opening parenthesis and close with a closing parenthesis. The function for comment is thus just opening parenthesis. It puts the closing parenthesis on the stack uh, as an ASCII value, which is 41, and then just collects everything until it finds that. That's what Word does and then drops the parentheses again, ignoring all the input. That's what drop does, or drop drops the parentheses. It is an immediate word, as you can see in the end, which basically means that it should be run as soon as is seen in the code by the compiler, um, comparable to what a macro would do in other languages. And thus implementing comments is as simple as telling the compiler to just jump ahead and ignore a bunch of stuff. Let's look at APL. APL stands for a programming language, but I always imagine it to stand for array programming language. APL and its descendants, there is a whole family, like for all of the languages that I mentioned in this talk, mostly operate on n-dimensional arrays. Everything is an operation on an array, and this too leads to idiosyncratic solutions. APL also has a somewhat infamous fetish for unique glyphs. And I couldn't get LaTeX to render my code example, so I decided to type them into a REPL and take a screenshot. That's what we're working with. I actually brought two examples. Everything behind this little round figure with legs is a comment. So this is the first and only example in this talk for documented code. The first program sums the numbers from 1 to 15 uh, by building an array, and then reducing over it using addition. In APL, you usually re read the program from right to left, barring any comments. The second example is a little more tricky. It's the outer product of the numbers from 1 to 10 with themselves, which is a very fancy way to say that it's all the combinations of the numbers from 1 to 10. The first three glyphs implement the outer product part, the judgmental emoticon in the middle, says to use the argument to its right twice to the thing on its left, and then we take the numbers from 1 to 10, making the, the outer product of the numbers from 1 to 10 with the numbers from 1 to 10. Now, this has been a tour de force of four completely and utterly anachronistic languages. But the main question that you might have right now is, so what? I mean, this is all cool, and the examples that I showed might have made you go, huh, this is really clever. 
but does it really do anything for us? What do we gain by giving up the comfort of something more expressive, more general maybe? And I'm not naming names here. Uh, every language is a beautiful flower in its own right. I like to think that thinking that uses less, less axioms is more learnable. The less base things I need to know, the better. And it answers a lot of questions. How do I do anything in Lisp in fourth and ABL? Well, I use a list, a stack, an array. I encourage you to read, it's uh, not what programming languages do, it's what they shepherd you, you to by UC Pakanen. I probably butchered that name, sorry about that. But the other side of the equation is that you have a lot of new questions to answer that you didn't have to answer before. How do I, do I talk to the file system if everything is an array? In what way is a graphic stack an object? But I think that there is a quality here that is liberating, a breath of fresh air in a world that is all too often concerned with what we already do day to day. Constraints can be liberating instead of, well, constraining. This is purely anecdotal, but I found to be highly productive in Smalltalk and Lisp because I could just pop in a, a <laughs> I could just pop open any piece of machinery, no matter how deep in my stack, and understand it, because it speaks the same language that I speak. Fifteen layers of abstraction later, there is something to be said for using the same tools everywhere. It leads to a certain uniformity, charm, and maybe even creativity that I personally miss otherwise. I certainly feel very creative coming up with weird solution to problems that are very easy to solve in other languages. And so in conclusion, if I'm asked to use a hammer, I'm fully prepared to make the world my nail. Thank you. And since I was the last thing standing, standing between you and your surely lovely lunch, bon appétit. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> I like the, um, the judgmental face in the APL code. I'm sure it was not complaining about your talk. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> okay, so that was this blog. Um, the way it's going to play out next is that our program will resume at 4 p.m., 1400 hours in UTC plus two. Um, so we'll have a long break also to accommodate um, speakers who will join us from the US. And we have two like break activities for you. I already described the gather town, right? And we would just do that um, like directly after this. I would post a short message in general in the general stream or something. And we can see if that if we can break that. <laughs> and the second activity will be another round of random chats. If you're interested in that, like I think at, at this point around 20 people are in that stream, and if you would like to be like randomly paired with someone new to meet, you can join that stream, and we will like run another round of that at around 1 p.m. So in 30 minutes, um, I think that's everything we wanted to mention before the break. Um, yeah, see you after that.
Good morning. Does the sound seem okay? Great, thank you so much.
Hey everyone, I hope you all had a nice lunch break. Mia had a really tasty lunch, but it's time to get started with the second half of the conference. To start, we have the keynote talk from Nikki Stevens. Nikki's joining us from all the way in the US. It's super early over there, so thanks so much for waking up early and being here with us. In choosing who to invite for the keynote, we thought it was super important on the organizing team to talk about how technology interacts with the world. We all love building cool technology, but it's important to also think deeply about what impact these tools might have. We really loved and learned a lot from the previous talks of Nikki's that we saw. Nikki's a software engineer and a PhD candidate affiliated with Dartmouth and Arizona State University. Nikki's studying software engineering, surveillance, and data ethics. At the end of the talk, there will be a Q&A, so please post your questions in Zulip. And with that, I hand things over to Nikki. Thank you so much. Thanks for that great introduction, Chris. <laughs> um, I'm super happy to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, so like Chris mentioned, I'm, um, these are three organizations that I'm affiliated with, Arizona State University, um, Dartmouth College, and then that blue icon in the middle is for Drupal. Um, I was a active Drupal contributor for about 10 years, involved in open source software communities. Um, and I include all three of these because I think it's important to know sort of like um, the organizations that I'm affiliated with and, and where I'm coming from. Um, I'm also coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah, where um, this is a picture of the protest that was there a couple of days ago. Um, as you probably know, we're in the middle of international protests um, or of national protests where we're rioting. Um, people are, are are in the streets to take issue with the way that the policing in the United States is being run. Um, we are currently, as a country, I think grappling with the long legacy of our foundational history built on the kidnapping and enslavement of Africans. Um, so if you're in the US, your work is also a part of this system. My work is a part of this system. Everything that we're gonna talk about today, even though not explicitly about these protests, is about this system of white supremacy, heteronormativity, cis normativity, um, ableism, uh, at all of which is, is coming to a head um, here in the States today. Um, so that's about where I am and the position that I'm coming from. Um, so a little bit about you all. Um, and I like to start by, by calling everyone into this label of technologist. Um, if you're here, if you're thinking about technology, whatever you call yourself, whether it's a content strategist, a DevOps person, a programmer, a CTO, right? you're a technologist. Um, I really like this artwork um, by Lauren Vani, a piece called The Natural Order of Things. And one of the things that I encourage all of you to start thinking about now and that we're gonna continue to talk about is, is the way things are the natural conclusion of a series of events, right? Could things have turned out another way? Um, this is my favorite computer joke, which is harder to do over a live stream than it is in real life. Um, but it reads, there are only two types of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. Um, I'm gonna wait while you laugh. Um, one of the reasons I like that joke is because one of the things that we treat as inevitable in computing is our, our use of, the, of binary number systems. We think, well, things are either on or off. On and off is the natural order of things. We couldn't have a, a computing foundation built on another system, but we almost did, right? We almost had a ternary system, a balanced ternary system. And this is a picture of a balanced ternary machine out of Moscow State University in the, I think, 40s. Um, so even this, this thing that we think to be so foundational that our humor is built on it could have been another way. And so one of the things that I invite you to think about is the way that nothing in our industry broadly constructed, this technology industry that we work in, is inevitable, was inevitable, is inevitable, and is unchangeable. And so I invite you to imagine a set of different futures today. Can you imagine a, a different future for the work that you're doing individually in your organization, in your team, in your open source software community? Can you imagine a different future for the city, country, and planet that you're in? Um, and at least in the United States, a question of who has access to the future is really salient, right? Who among us has access to even imagine different futures, to imagine that, that in a year or five years or 10 years, our lives are not gonna be mediated by state or governmental violence. 
So if you are a person who has access to those futures, I think you have a responsibility to start imagining them if you haven't been already. Um, a lot of folks will say, you know what, I don't work in the government, I don't work in politics, I don't work in controversial um, domains, right? I Then this is a thing that I used to tell myself. I was like, you know what, my political work is separate, and then when I go to work, you know, I'm just building, uh, you know, in one case, I was like, I'm just building, um, you know, Instagram widgets. I'm just, I'm just connecting to Instagram APIs and serving marketing content for a company like Sony or Pepsi, right? These things are so separate, um, but they're not. And I, and one of the things that I would love to hear about, um, and I have the chat open somewhere, um, is what you think politics is. Um, what is politics? What is political work? Um, because my insistence, right, is that technology work is political. And if you still don't think that it's political, my favorite example of this, um, this is a wireframe that I stole from somewhere, is thinking about who gets, who gets to be um, here on this homepage, who gets content in each of these boxes. Those conversations are deeply and aggressively political. So technology work is political internally. Um, technology work is also political externally. And um, I've got a content warning slide up here because the next bunch of slides are gonna um, cover structural oppressions, at least in the United States. So just a heads up. Um, so some of the externally political things that are driven solely, that are driven primarily by technology today um, includes um, this company called Predpol, which does predictive policing. Um, and uh, I'm gonna include book recommendations with some of these so that you can go um, and do some reading if you would like to. So, so predictive policing, we have software that we give to our police stations, um, our police military industrial complex that helps the police think that they understand where there will be crime in the future using machine learning and algorithmic decision trees. This is a picture of Skid Row, which is a homeless encampment in Los Angeles. And we use automated systems to figure out who among these individuals deserves a home, who will have a home and make the best use of it. Um, if you wanna read more about those, you can read this great book called Automating Inequality by Dr. Virginia Eubanks. Um, and my slides will be available after. Um, we ask questions about who should get parole using technology, um, using algorithmic decision-making, using artificial intelligence, which among these incarcerated individuals, des air quotes, deserves parole. Um, we use computer vision for so many things right now, right? So um, this is a screenshot of a tweet sent by an African-American um, revealing that the picture that they are in has been categorized as a gorilla by um, Google's machine learning algorithm. Here's another example of a Nikon camera of an Asian woman. The camera recognizes her as a person with their eyes closed. Um, here's a picture of a family, presumably a couple of families um, of people, and they are categorized by their gender, perceived gender and their perceived age. All of these bad for lots of reasons. Um, if you want to read more about facial recognition in particular, here are two really great books, um, Our Biometric Future by Dr. Kelly Gates and Portraits of Automated Facial Recognition by Dr. Lila Lee Morrison. Um, probably the most famous example here is Google searches for black girls used to result in porn rather than content about black children. And if you wanna read more about that, um, I strongly recommend Dr. Safiya Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, of all of them, it's probably the fastest to read and the most accessible. So all of these are ways that, that um, the technology that we build is externally very political and also very um, impactful, right? And um, you might have heard the phrase algorithmic bias or algorithmic injustice, um, this book, you know, it's called Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and we think, I think we think a lot of times that these problems that we're having are new. 
that we're having new problems with algorithms because we have new technology. Um, but one of the oldest problems that tech um, and algorithms have had is questions about like who the user is do, and, and, and how do we design algorithms and how do we design systems for these users. Uh, my favorite example of algorithmic problems is the example of how the US Air Force, and here's a picture of some planes, how the US Air Force decided to design the perfect cockpit. And so they wanted, you know, they were having, uh, they had lots of information about how pilots didn't fly as well when, um, when the seat was too far back, when, you know, the angle of the windshield wasn't right for them, when the controls were too far away. So they designed an algorithm to, to develop the perfect cockpit for their pilots. And they went and they measured, um, you know, I think up to like 10,000 or so individual men. And they designed a cockpit for the average man. Um, but of course, that average man doesn't exist at all. The average man is a person who is, according to their algorithm, right? A person with a certain length of arms, a certain length of legs, a certain length of torso, averaged among all of these. But that user, that pilot, that person did not exist at all. So we've been having problems with algorithms out of sync with um, perhaps the lived reality of people. You know, this was in the, like, the 20s or 30s. Um, if you wanna read more about the way that this impacts tech in particular, you can read this great book called Technically Wrong. Um, and in there, she talks specifically about the way that we will use personas, especially in UX design, to design for these users, but, but personas are also deeply problematic. And I think um, one of the things that seems obvious, but that I like to remind all of us, is that the internet, tech, all of these systems um, are powered by, by people and, and by objects that really exist in the real world. So when we joke that the internet is a series of tubes, right? it, it literally is a series of, of undersea cables. Um, but also the internet is not just a series of tubes. The internet is a series of power hungry data centers that have a real ecological impact and human impact, right? Um, this is a picture of a boy at the largest e-waste site in Ghana. Um, Dr. Safiya Noble, whose book I recommended earlier, uh, said once, you know, the greatest tech challenge is to make a cell phone that doesn't hurt anybody when it's being created, when it's being used, or when it's being destroyed. And when I think about this, I think about how we are all part of this system. We are all part of many systems. Um, and, and offer this reminder, right, that in systems, all of us are connected. Um, and this, I think, for an audience of technologists, um, is good news. We are, we're in systems, we're all connected. That means we are able to have impacts on other people in our systems, other systems within our systems. Um, it also means that most of us as technologists, we're trained to think in systems. We're trained to think about not just our work, but the way that our work impacts the next set of work. So um, maybe you've seen this image before. Um, this is the software development life cycle. Um, and most of us are working, whether it's explicit or not, we're working within this, this small system, right? Um, my work mostly came in the green and blue, uh, the design and implementation in this circle. Um, and you know, that work was always directly impacted by the work done in the requirement section and in previous iterations, right? Um, so, so we're already thinking in systems. It's a thing that we've been trained to do that we've been doing probably for most of our careers. Um, and my work in particular, I'm gonna talk about my own academic research just for a minute, um, takes a look at the system and says, well, all of, a lot of those tech problems that we talked about before, the algorithms of oppression, um, the ways that we're using algorithms to determine who gets houses and who gets, who gets welfare, um, those are all described as algorithmic bias and algorithmic problems. And I'm saying, well, since we're in a system, maybe one of the things that we can do is take one step back and intervene at the design level. Um, and for me, in that design level is database design and data modeling. So one of the things that I'm looking at specifically is data models. Um, so 
I'm going to show you a couple of things and then we're going one slide is out of order. I just realized I apologize. Um, so what do these three or four things have in common? So this smart toothbrush by Oral-B, um, this smart coffee maker that I guess if you're very fancy, you have just sort of like a pipe coming out of your countertop that makes you coffee and then, uh, you know, an iPad. Um, and this, you know, is a picture of um, Lovins, which is a sex tech website, a teledildonics website. Um, so what do these three things have in common? It's kind of a trick question. The answer is that they're all surveillance devices. Um, so one of the reasons that I like looking at these, and I'll, I guess I'll leave this one up for a minute. One of the reasons that I like looking at these is because I think for a lot of folks, especially white folks in the United States, when we think about all of those political implications that we talked about earlier, we think about um, prison systems, we think about houselessness, we think about welfare, um, we think, well, they don't affect me. They're far away from my life, right? The percentage of white people in the United States who have had um, interactions with law enforcement or with prison systems is much lower, again, because of America's um, foundation and history than African-Americans who have had interactions with those systems. And so a lot of white folks will think, well, you know, I'm not working in that tech, I'm not building that tech, um, and that tech doesn't impact me. And so I'm specifically looking at tech that most of us, if we don't use, we might be open to using now, right? A smart toothbrush seems pretty innocent. A smart coffee maker is pretty tight, right? You can get your coffee made from bed before you get up and have it waiting for you when you come downstairs. Um, you know, internet connected sex toys, pretty fun. So, so these are all tech that we're open to using. And one of the things that I'm specifically thinking about is how is this tech that we're using, that we're building, that we're thinking about the sort of fun tech, how is this tech also connected to this, these bigger structural problems that we're having, at least here in the United States, but I suspect also elsewhere. So um, specifically, I researched the data models for these devices, and I'm calling these devices intimate and invited surveillance devices, right? They're, they're in your home, and you're specifically inviting them in. Um, so I do uh, three specific things with them. Um, the first thing that I do uh, is the funnest, right? I hack into them. So I decompile their code bases. Um, I Specifically, I use the Android platform just because it's easier to hack into, right? So I decompile their APKs and then I read through the code. And I look for I look for comments if they haven't obfuscated them. I look for connections to databases and data sources. Um, and then I think about how that code got written and what the assumptions that the folks who wrote that code might have been making. And as a person who spent many years writing code, I know that that's not a complete picture, but it's a way in. Um, here's a picture of two of the devices, content warning, <laughs> of two of the devices that I'm specifically researching and hacking into. Um, so the second thing that I do is that I reverse engineer their data models. So here's a picture um, of a reverse engineered data model of that, um, of the internet connected sex toys that were in the previous slide. Um, Again, as a person who has built data models for much of their career, this is not a perfect picture of what's happening, um, especially because I didn't build those data models myself, but it gives me insight into some of the assumptions that folks were making on the design team. And this is too small to read, um, so I don't expect you to, um, but I will point out that like in reverse engineering, these data models in particular, um, I was able to see that the creators had a pretty expansive sense of what might connect to what. Um, these devices are sold in pairs, in like a male and female pair. Um, as a person who does not exist in that gender binary, I'm not particularly interested in being a part of that kind of pair. Um, but the, the designers of the database didn't program in uh, gender connected to the objects. So in this case, right, some of their early design choices were very expansive and very inclusive, um, which is the third step, um, that I connect the data structures that I'm finding to systems of power that I'm, that for me in the United States, States today, I'm problematizing. So this for me is sort of the culmination of um, 
of my training as a technologist in systems thinking. So I look at, at these technical systems and I look at our social systems and I say, how are these systems connected? Because they are, because they can't not be connected, right? Um, and, and this has given me an opportunity to think about the ways that the small choices that we make as engineers are impacted, are impactful in the larger system, right? These tiny choices that we're making, the ability to have control over whether or not a device is connected to a gender, whether or not two devices labeled as female can connect to each other, for example, right? These small choices have impacts greater than we can anticipate. Um, and so one of the things that, that I always think about is, do small choices matter? When we're, and, and one of the questions that I want to encourage you to think about is, what are the ways that the small choices you make matter? Um, this is my favorite slide from one of my favorite shows. Um, and, and in it, right, the, the Starship Enterprise is staring out at a, at a sea of other enterprises. And those other enterprises are all one or two small choices off from the reality that, that they're experiencing. And some of those realities are better for some people, some of them are better for others. Um, but all of these realities could have existed at one point. And I think it's easy to, to think about this and feel overwhelmed, to think about making changes and feel overwhelmed. Um, and I think it's important to remember, thinking about systems again, that we collaboratively, both you know, in <clears throat> our society, but also in tech, specifically in tech, we have created a system that makes collaborative work look like individual achievement. And the reason that this, I think, is important to remember is because, one, it erases the labor of everyone else who builds the thing that we're building. You know, it's easy to give credit. It's tempting. We're trained to give credit to the hotshot developer, right? We even call them rock star developers, ninja developers in our, in our advertisements. Maybe some of you have called yourselves rock stars or ninjas in the past. Um, I'm not saying I maybe never have, um, but I don't anymore because I've realized through my open source work, I think um, in, largely that the work that I do is hugely dependent on the work that other people do. And we are all in this system, in this technical system in which we're working, really dependent on each other to make good choices together and to move forward together. Um, this also reminds me that because we're all connected, right? I'm able to make small choices that have positive impacts on the tech that I'm building. Um, and so I'm gonna close with just a couple of things that I am certain are true for you, this person watching, right? I'm certain that you as like a human being want to be good to the people around you. Um, and the people around you are more than just your, your intimates, your family and your friends and your coworkers. They're the people in your community. And I'm certain that you want to be good to them. I'm certain that you want to make an impact in some way, um, that not all of our impacts are gonna be the same, but that you are most likely a person who wants to make an impact because you're a person who makes things. Um, you wanna help the things that you care about and, and leave them better, right? And so I think it's an important question to ask, like what is it in particular that you care about? Um, it almost doesn't matter what your answer is, because if you've identified a thing or two that you care about, then we know that you're not neutral. You're not ambivalent to everything that's happening around you. Um, and so your work is not neutral, your work is not apolitical, and you yourself are not neutral or apolitical. Um, and so it's an emphatic reminder, right, about the work that you do, your technology work, yours in particular, impacts the world and impacts the systems that you're a part of. And so we need to think really carefully about the things that we build. Um, we all in this moment have access to imagine different futures. And I've got this image up just as a placeholder, as a stand-in. You know, I think it's tempting to look, to, to be a technologist and to look at a social problem and say, technology will solve this social problem. Technology will make this social problem better. 
we, I as a technologist can intervene and, and do some fixing here in a way that will make things better for the people and things that I care about. And sometimes that's true, but a lot of times that is not true. And so as you're thinking about this world you wanna build, and as you're thinking about the impacts that you wanna make, um, I think it's really wise of us to pull back a little bit from techno solutionism, from thinking that the things that we build are gonna solve problems. One of the conversations we're having in the United States today, um, as our police are murdering our citizens, is do the police need body cams? If every police officer had body cams, would they do less murder? Maybe, the data is not really conclusive on that. Um, when perhaps in this case, the question is not, how do we solve the murdering of police with tech, but instead, how do we, how do we eliminate police? Um, and, and I think, you know, as a technologist, as a systems thinker, you're already primed to think about, rather than, rather than putting a tech bandaid on something, how can I eliminate the source of the problem itself? Um, and so I encourage you to think through whether or not your version in whatever um, society you're in, whether your version of body cams is something that you're working on or whether you're able to look at, look at the problem and say, well, actually what we need to do is eliminate the source of the murdering, not put some tech to lower the murdering, right? Um, so I close with you know, my favorite question. What kind of future are you building? Who is it for? Um, and I would love to talk about these questions with you during the Q&A. So thank you. And that um, on the screen is my Twitter handle and I would love to interact with you there as well. Hi, thanks Nikki so much. Uh, I really love the talk and I'm just gonna read some questions from the chat. So uh, anyone listening, uh, just go ahead and post your questions in there and I'm gonna go ahead and read them out. Uh, I was the first to post a question in the chat, so I'm going to take advantage and just ask <laughs> my own question. Great. Great. So the question for me is, like, how can people balance, like, wanting to do something in alignment with their values and, like, take agency versus just so many job opportunities and, like, opportunities in general or research funding being geared towards, like, surveillance and the military? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how can we kind of... Uh, I don't know, balance, balance these two competing forces. I'm curious yeah. what you think. I love that question so much. I think about it a lot in academia where um, a lot of universities are funded by, depart in the United States, at least Department of Defense and military money. Um, you know, or if it's not Department of Defense, it's Google, who, depending on your perspective, right, is good or not good. Um, I would go for not good. Um, and so I think, you know, I think also when we think about money, we have to think about the fact that we just, in reality, have responsibilities to like our children, our spouses, our elders. Um, and so, you know, whenever I think about this question, I think about a quote by, uh, I think his name is Robert Oppenheimer, one of the guys who worked on the nuclear bomb, right? And he talked about how many of his friends defected, his, his physicist friends defected, and they protested from the outside, and he stayed on the inside. And he said, I'm going to stay here and make change from the inside. And his conclusion was, you cannot. When the problem is that big and that serious, you have to leave and you have to do work from the outside um, for him. And so I think one of the first things that I'll say is that what we need to do is make sure that we know whether we're on the inside or the outside. I think that for us, for many of us would be a huge leap. So many of us think we're on the outside, but we're actually not. Um, we're actually already on the inside. We're already imbricated. We're already stuck in these systems. I'm including myself in that, right? I work for two universities that make their money on Department of Defense funding. Um, and the best that I can do with the resources that I have right now is to, to sort of like be an agitator from within. Um, and, and so uh, I wish I had like this, this tidy and easy answer for you. I think it's more a sense of awareness of, right? Like I'm within this really dysfunctional system. Um, can I do good in, in, in a tinier system that I'm a part of within it? Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much for yeah. your thoughts on that. And the next question we have, uh, someone asks that they'd like to hear your opinion on the merits and drawbacks of licensing. So like, you know, like, yeah, license, software licensing that sure. prohibits specific uses like military force when developing free and open source software. 
Yeah, I love this question also. Um, you know, for a while there was, I think Coraline Ada, right, has a license out right now, um, if, if not now, soon, um, doing this very thing. Um, Christy Kohler, who's an open source developer out of Portland, has a lot of very smart thoughts about this. So I would look, and the, these two are in direct opposition. So Coraline is advancing a license um, prohibiting certain kinds of use and Christy is objecting. Um, so I would go to both of them for some really deep and nuanced thoughts on this. Um, from my perspective, I think one of the things that we know as open source developers is that once you put it on GitHub, it's out of your control. Um, and one of the things that I think we also know is that we can't predict in some cases, how something's going to be used, right? So there's there was a lot of conversation in the Node community, right, about this really innocent packages, right, being used as part of um, ICE software in the United States, like immigration um, and and immigrant policing software. And so I think that we don't yet have a way to enforce those licenses. And I think that sometimes those licenses serve as virtue signaling. Um, you know, which is which is its own sort of good thing in some cases, right? Me having a code of conduct in my open source repo is a form of virtue signaling, right? It's a form of saying, here are my political beliefs. If you're gonna if you're gonna be in my issue queue, here's how I want you to behave. Um, putting a license on my open source software says, okay, here's some things that I don't want you to do with it. I have no way to enforce it as an open source developer, right? Even Drupal, which is one of the biggest open source communities, which has a lot of money still does not have a ton of money to go after folks who might be violating their license. So, so it's one of those things that I think, again, if we can right size it and say, this is good for what I can guarantee that it does, but I can't guarantee that it's actually being implemented. Um, yeah, but go to those two folks because they have great thoughts. And the next question that we have is, uh how can we nudge companies to actually implement, for example, privacy by default from the start instead yeah. of an afterthought? And not just because privacy laws require them, but because they feel guilty if they hoarded that data. Yeah, another great question. I think, and this question for me bumps up again into that idea of like, of like in so many ways, in so many ways, we are all individually so empowered, um, especially in community, especially when we come together with folks who share our values to build a thing. You know, and anyone who's worked in open source has experienced this, I think. Um, and also, we are subject to our corporate overlords, right? And really, in some some ways, really sort of limited by what we can do. So thinking about, I think about the small agencies where I've worked and small companies where I've worked, um, and in those cases you know, one voice makes a huge difference. At a small agency roundtable, one out of 10 is really huge. And so I think the first thing, if you're in that kind of context, the first thing that you can do is like, learn to trust um, your own voice and your own opinion and your own set of values as you advocate for these good things. Um, I think the other thing that has been going around in tech for a while is, um, at least in my circles, is do we need a union? Do we need some sort of collective bargaining unit so that we as a group of software engineers can come together and say, no, we're not gonna build, we're not gonna build software for body cams. We're not gonna build software that does facial recognition on people that the US wants to deport. Um, and, and a lot of these things, you know, the questioner referenced not just because of privacy laws, um, but at, at, at its core, corporations are only gonna do, typically only gonna do what they have to to get by, right? What, is going to keep them safe legally and economically. And so a lot of these changes will effectively start at the policy level for most companies. And so one of the things that we could do that a, that a union would give us is collective bargaining to push policy for policy changes forward. Um, the other thing that I think all of us could do um, more of together, and I'm including myself in this, is um, more interaction with like local and state governments to push policy forward. Um, and figuring out who our local policymakers are for whatever you care about, whether it's privacy um, or, you know, in the U.S., sort of like, you know, data security and and, um, and government use of data. I think getting involved with policy would be really helpful as well. 
Very cool. And I think the next question seems like a fun one. It's uh, how do you approach uh, reverse engineering all these devices? Oh my God, it's so fun. You're right, that is a fun one. <laughs> um, so there's a great guy named, holy, oh, I'm gonna forget his, his name is Kyle. Uh, oh, he's QDOT on Twitter. And Kyle runs MetaFetish. Um, so, so even though I research more than sex toys, my, I learned how to reverse engineer in particular from Kyle in the, in the way that I do it now. Um, so I wanna give him props for that. Um, so uh, reverse engineering an Android application is hella easy. I invite you all to do it um, and I'll tell you exactly how to do it. You go onto an APK mirror and you download the APK itself to your desktop. I'm on a Mac, so I just download it to my desktop. And then there's a website called javadecompilers.net, I think, right? You upload it there, you download the, um, the resulting um, zip files, and then I open that in um, the Android editor and then sort of poke around. Um, there's some command line tools you can use. If you're a person who's comfortable with command line, you can install some stuff locally. Um, but the very easiest thing to do is just run it through Java decompilers after you download it. Um, and <clears throat> if you pick one, and this is, is gonna sound ungenerous, but I don't mean it to be so. If you pick an application that comes from something like Samsung, which I know personally <laughs> because they have smart fridges, um, their code is gonna be highly obfuscated. It's gonna be pr protected against decompilation. The comments are gonna be obfuscated. And what you're gonna get back is just a series of sort of like unreadable you know, code. If you pick an application made by a small team, maybe that's a couple of years old, what you're gonna get back is the complete source code, completely readable, including all of the database connections. Um, and then, you know, don't be mean. <laughs> so uh, to be clear, I'm not, I'm not reverse engineering and then DDoSing the vendor servers, right? Um, I'm not going in sniffing around for URLs. I'm not dealing with um, application security. So I'm not doing any penetration testing. I'm just reverse engineering to, to get some insight into how the developers did it. But it's hella easy, we should all do it because it might make you think twice about the Android apps you install. That's cool. Yeah, I played around with that at a previous job and it was really fun. So, yeah, it's yeah. so fun. <laughs> uh, and we have another question in the chat. And for those listening, feel free to just keep posting the questions. I think we have time and yeah. we can, I don't know if you have anything on your mind. Okay, so this next question is, uh, I wonder what a good strategy is to start discussion on this topic. Uh, we're all part of the oppressive system in our own cir social circles. And uh, what can we learn uh, discussing this with others? Yeah, I love this question. Um, Y'all are asking such good questions this morning, <laughs> or this afternoon. Um, so in the US, there's a lot of conversations about how to start the conversation. Um, so when I post my slides, I can post some of those links. Um, I think one of the things that I always talk about is that like, it's hard to start the conversation. It's hard to, it is hard to start hard conversations when you feel unprepared yourself, you know? And so, especially if you're trying to have a conversation about oppressive systems with another person who benefits from that oppressive system, that's a really tough task if you haven't done some reading on your own. Even if you, um, even if you feel like your values are clear, like having a set of talking points, having some um, some defenses to sort of common arguments makes those conversations a lot easier. And I think also uh, maybe helps to give us a little bit more patience as we're trying to get folks to see the systems in the way that we've all, all, always been trained to see the systems, right? So the first thing that I want to say is just like do some reading. The second thing is have some practice conversations with people you know are aligned with your worldview and sort of just get comfortable. You know, talking about hard stuff is hard and it gets easier the more you do it. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about this stuff for years and so I'm happy to do it with anyone, um, but I'm also finishing a PhD, right? So I've been talking about this for a long time with lots of different people. Um, but I couldn't have done this six years ago or seven years ago, right? It would have, I would have been so uncomfortable about it. Um, and I think the third thing is, um, you know, I had a professor once recommend that you write up on like the size of a business card, four or five things that you are absolutely certain are true about a topic. Um, and then you're able to go in and, and use those to kind of keep coming back to. 
right? So in any conversation, I will not be convinced, for example, that um, reverse racism is, racism is true in the United States or anywhere, but right? So that for me is sort of a foundational thing um, that an, a, a counter argument to which I will not engage in. Um, and so, so all of that work, all of those answers are not about conversations at all, really they're about individual preparation to have conversations. And I think that's the very best thing because it's what I don't want is for folks to go and start having hard conversations and then get really discouraged and really frustrated and, and not want to do it again um, because now is the time to, to be doing them. So lots of individual prep. Um, if you want to DM me on Twitter, I can send you, like I can answer specific questions, um, but I will also post a link to reading research, more reading resources um, when I post my talk. And we even have another question here. Uh, as a slightly different perspective to the very first question, how should open source projects deal with companies or with contributions from companies like Palantir, et cetera? So I've seen some, I've seen them being very hesitant to avoid such contributions and ties yeah. for what I perceive as a fear of not being seen as a viable choice for other less problematic companies. Yeah. Thank you for that question. That's like a, that's like a good hard question. Um, you know, in Drupal, and I won't name names, um, but if you do some Googling, you can find out all the details if you want them. Um, in Drupal, we had a couple of years ago, we had a problem in a situation in which a key individual contributor, so this is not a company, a key individual human contributor was found to be engaging in um, misogynistic practices um, as part of his work. And so, it came out that he believed that women should be subservient to men. He'd given some public speeches to this effect and the community immediately split between, he's an excellent developer. Um, he writes really good code. He's done a lot of good contributions for us and we don't need this sort of person in a leadership role in our community, right? Um, and both of those things can kind of be true simultaneously. Um, and we didn't, you know, the end of that story is not a happy one. We didn't all agree on one or the other. We ended up sort of deeply divided. The community was deeply divided for a long time over whether or not this person should get to stay in his role, should he get demoted, should he get to come to conferences. There were lots of folks who'd had really negative individual experiences with him. Should who, you know, whose perspective, his comfort, their comfort, who gets to win. So um, one of the things that I learned and I think that the community learned from that is that you have to, your values have to be crystal clear. Because if figuring out your values in the midst of all of this is not the right time, right? Because you're being really reactionary to this person who might be your friend or this person, or um, there's a lot of really tough interpersonal stuff going on. So so uh, one of the things, you know, kind of like that earlier question of how do you have these hard conversations is how do you make these tough calls? And it's you do it before the tough call is necessary. So if you're a small community, right? If you're, if you're not trying to get picked up by Sony um, if you're just like, I wrote a package because I needed it and then now I'm giving it to you, make those values crystal clear before it even happens. Um, if, uh, which is kind of one of my, like my favorite kind of open source contribution, right? Um, I use a product called Zettler, which I love, which I'm a patron of. Um, and it's just like a dude in Germany writing this cool software and being cool. Um, but if you're a part of an open source community, that like Drupal is a big now international million billion dollar sort of product. Um, that organization, and, I, and I'm not saying that this is how Drupal feels, but that organization is not going to reject contributions from anyone with money. Um, their values don't allow it. Um, and you know, unless unless you're a person who has a ton of power in that community and can push to get that value explicit. Um, and I think it's a thing that's possible. I think we can say we're not going to accept values from companies that do business with ICE or with immigration in the U.S., right? Um, but you can't do it when ICE is knocking at your door because what you're going to end up doing is losing a lot of contributors and losing a lot of credibility. Um, so making those, those tough decisions before the tough moments, my recommendation. Sometimes it's too late. Thanks so much, Nikki. This has been like really interesting and I really have a lot to think about and read, you know, in the upcoming times. Awesome. I'm sorry, everyone, but uh, we don't have any more time for questions. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you so much for yeah. joining us, Nikki. And I know thank it was you. super early. Uh, and thanks everyone uh, for your questions. And 
we'll be starting the next block of talks in uh, 10 minutes at uh, 15 UTC plus 2. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to yeah more talks the rest of the day. Thanks, Thanks again, everyone. Nikki. Bye.
Hi everyone, um, welcome back. Uh, now is the time to let me know if my mic doesn't work. Um, so, I apparently have the stream running elsewhere too, so I can hear myself. Let me just switch that off, okay. Um, so, like I said, welcome back. I think, yeah, a moment ago I checked and there are about a hundred of us on, on Zulip. So in some ways that might mean this is the uh, the biggest enthusiasticon uh, we've had. So thank you all for making that happen. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about our next speaker. Uh, Lisa is, uh, well, she says that um, the sort of graph of her hobbies, side projects and prototypes has skyrocketed, or uh, that's my phrasing. She says uh, it's hockey sticked. Um, that's really nice to know, I think. Um, sort of encouraging. Um, I don't know much about hardware, so I'm looking forward to this talk. Um, and I'll let her take the uh, virtual stage. Cool, thank you. Can you hear me? Is that all right? Um, yes, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Lisa, and I'm going to jump right into it. Um, welcome to Build Your Own Controller. I'm excited to kick off the, the third block after the amazing keynote um, and like the amazing talks from like the beginning of the day. Um, so yeah, I want to start off by saying um, video games are amazing and they were definitely like my gateway into like tech at all, um, like from, from when I was younger. And I think video games are an amazing medium for us to like create and experience things that we usually wouldn't like experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, this might be like adventures, but this might also be like uh, other experiences that, that create empathy on so many levels. And I think this is um, or like the most important part about this is um, that it's not just like we're not just observing or listening to things because um, in video games we can interact with them. And this is kind of like the, the thing that I like the most is like uh, if you if you actually can make decisions in a game that that change the outcome that like kind of like you make it your own. Um, so that being said, uh, I think there's a way that we can make the video games even better or like this experience um, even better uh, because a lot of times uh, games these days are limited to the interfaces that we have to interact with the software that they are. So this could be a keyboard and mouse, um, a game controller for a console or a touch device. So this is fun, like, you know, like some games are like, um, like fun on your phone and you can like wiggle around or tap them, but this is still like, if, while this is some part of or like some form of interaction, I think um, it's also very removed sometimes from the mechanic that the game actually like displays or like the, the action that you actually do. So one solution that that I really fell in love with um, and this like thing like is making video games even better um, is uh, if we build our own interfaces, our, our own uh, controllers. And I want to like. Um, yeah, show you a little bit of like what I mean with like because maybe if you're like completely new to this to the scene or like to this kind of like way of thinking about video games, um, I want to kick off with some um, examples that I found uh, hilarious and like really inspiring. Um, uh, so took a long uh, took a second. Um, so this game is called Hell Couch, where you literally play a game by like sitting up, uh, sitting down and standing up from a couch uh, to to release a demon um, through this like sitting and standing ritual, which I think is like amazing um the perfect couch game if you will um the next one that i've also thought is like ingenious is um robo mama's cooking kitchen uh where you uh, someone took a, like a pink plastic kids like fake children um kitchen toy and hooked up a bunch of electronics to make this like cooking sip like real life cooking simulation game which is like it's amazing it's also so well done i encourage you to click the link and watch the full video um, but it comes to be simple and like uh, very minimalistic, uh, like in this game, Mr. Floppy, uh, where someone just hacked an old, uh, an old floppy disk where you like have this little metal brace that you can like flip and then like springs back. And this is actually making the character in the game jump. Um, so when I see these things, I'm thinking like, oh, my God, this is so cool. And if I weren't already uh, doing the like, hardware controls, um, I would like wonder how do I get started because this is so cool and I hope this is also something that that you're wondering right now like how do I how do I get started with this um and um there's actually only like a few simple steps involved uh um if you break it down it's like you you kind of want to make a game you have an idea for a game um and then you have an idea for a controller like simple enough uh, then you build that controller and then you there's like a step that is maybe sometimes overlooked as like how you 
how your controller talks to your game engine or your creative coding environment or whatever you have that you want to make the um, the game with. Uh, and because this is only like a very short talk, I will completely like ignore the first two and leave this up to you and your imagination. Um, because uh, in the end, it, it doesn't really matter. I've also built a bunch of controllers just to to build the controllers and have like the the, the two last steps, like build a controller and have it talk to your computer um, just for the sake of it and build like a game idea around it. And then you can approach this from like various levels. But um, so like, I want to focus on the, the building part. Um, yeah, so build a controller and talk to your engine, computer, what have you. Um, and in the end, this is this is boils down to talk about microcontrollers or like getting started with your own hardware projects. Um, so this, um, some of you might be going like, oh my God, this is endless possibilities, right? Because like there's so like everything electronics wise is available to us and we can put it into our projects. And it is true. And it's super, super like amazing to think about that we can build this ourselves. Um, but it might also be scary if you're like completely new to electronics as well. Um, like, like, where do I get started? Isn't that like hard? I've never done anything like this before. Um, but I think this is maybe like something of a of a negative that can definitely turn turn into a positive because since we most of us are technologists and we interact with computers, I think it's also like very cool to know a little bit about how these components work, like how how do computers even work? Where is the the step from um, you know like a voltage that then becomes a digital signal, right? Um, but I have something for you that, that is called the Makey Makey. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. Um, and I have this little gift that shows you what it's like. I also have it here, uh, see in the camera. And it's um, it's a microcontroller that is supposed to like be easing you into electronics. And it, um, yeah, it already has this kind of like, uh, if you look at it, this uh, gamepad layout. And what it really is, is um, kind of like a game itself, if you will, it's, um, it's all about closing the circuit. Um, so at the bottom uh, of the Makey Makey, you have um, um, like a little surface that is that is labeled um, Earth. It's usually called ground, so which is um, uh, that you hold with one finger, for example. And then the other parts are labeled as either the arrow keys, space, or click. And then when I click or when I touch it with my other finger, um, I close the circuit. Like my body acts as like the the closing of the circuit. Um, and then I can do things, for example, uh, press space. And the, the magic behind this is that the, the moment you plug in the Makey Makey into your laptop, um, it will register as a, a keyboard and then it just like sends these keyboard signals directly to your computer. Um, and this is really fun because the, the possibility or like the just like the option of you having like uh, being able to choose how to close the circuit opens up a lot of, uh, really a lot of uh, possibilities for like interaction. Um, I've chosen an uh, example from a, a Berlin-based studio, uh, a game called High Five Romance Race, where in the in the picture on the in the corner you can see uh, two people sitting in chairs, and uh, what I just showed you in the GIF, where I like close the circuit by like touching two surfaces. Um, they've extended this in the uh, one chair, uh, like. Both chairs have uh, metal frames, so one the one chair is hooked up to the ground, and the other chair is hooked up to the space, like the the surface that says space. Then you have to like hold on with your body to the metal frame, um, and then when you high five the other person, you close the circuit. And this like the possibility of like ha having you sit down, like holding onto something, like you're actually sitting in the sidecar of the motorcycle that we see, um, and then high fiving the other person is perfectly mimicking, I think, this feeling of like high-fiving um, in the game than you uh, then used to um, evade the obstacles or collect the coins. And I think it's just like so beautiful. It's like one of my favorite games and um, uses of like uh, the makey-makey in, in a video game. Um, but maybe like this is not enough, like closing surfaces, uh, closing circuits um, is, is one thing to do. But like if you want to get like more into microcontrollers, um, you will have to at one point deal with um, the Arduino platform or Arduino hardware. Um, Arduino is a, is a mic is a basically a brand of, of open source or open hardware microcontrollers. Um, it's often used like almost synonymously to microcontrollers itself these days. And there's a bunch of different models. So just like a little pointer, um, the Arduino uh, Leonardo Micro and Due they have the same capability as the um, Makey Makey to register themselves as keyboards. So um, if you're measuring something or you have like other things going on in your circuit, you can then say in the software that you write, 
and now send um, a D keystroke or a space keystroke to the computer and then uh, work with that. So this is um, kind of nice, like, like gradually get like more, more into that. Um, other popular boards are the Arduino um, Uno or the Nano uh, I have on here. So this is like, a, like an off-brand Uno, which is what I mostly use because I have a bunch of them and they're not that expensive. Um, but when you do this, you kind of have to learn like a tiny bit uh, about serial communication protocols, like how does the, the little chip on the board like transfer data uh, to your laptop or like whatever computer you're using, Raspberry Pi. Um, and this is also really interesting because it's really like we have all this like fancy ways of like communi uh, communicating over wires and, and the air, uh, but then like looking actually like down on like how serial communication protocols really use this like, okay, this is like an agreed upon sequence of highs and lows and current um, encoding all the information that, that, that runs the world at this point. It's, it's, it's just super fascinating. Um, yeah, but to get started, you only need like a little bit and it's not scary at all. And then you can basically just send whatever information you want from the board, from your circuitry um, into your game engine or environment that you need. You can have all the sensors and modules available um, I have uh, one example later on, but there's really, there's so much. And if that's not enough for you, uh, just be creative and think of something that like anything can have a resistance. Um, almost like, yeah, a lot of like physical things have resistance. Um, and a lot of things can produce a current um, that you can also read from. Um, one game that I didn't, or that, that I won't feature uh, more prominently in this talk, I used an old um, PC cooling fan. Um, that you should like you're supposed to blow into and once the fan actually starts rotating um it would actually produce a current that you can then measure so, like the the higher the current the stronger you like blow into the fan um like the, the faster something would, would run so this is this is totally a possibility um a game that i do want to feature more prominently is a, is a game that i made it is called fishing for compliments um where the software part is written in processing um and the like a cardboard box controller uh, with a little um, water water filter, like water water stand sensor. So like if you dip the the, um, the sensor into a little jar of water, um, it would like at one point like reach a threshold and the, the hook in the game would start to sink also like with a more like watery kind of like slow sinking. And then you can like uh, hunt for the fish that will then give you a compliment. Um, and I want to like highlight this controller because that was like Kind of like the first times where I also wanted to like make it look a little bit nicer, but it's really just a cardboard box where I put in like a bunch of cables and my bad soldering, so like nobody had to look at that. Um, but it was like kind of cool, and it's like everybody can make this. Um, and I later uh, found out it was only like a month or two ago um, that this is actually not that different from off-the-shelf controllers. Uh, I got this old um, off-brand Xbox controller from a friend that was broken. Um, so I was like, yeah, I take it and like I took it apart. And this is the top side um, where you see like it's really the, the joysticks um, are pretty much the same as I use in my cardboard controller. Even like the, the LEDs are the same with the hot glue. Um, but then what really blew my mind was the the bottom of the controller where you had um, where you have these little DC motors with just like motors that spin uh, with a little bit of weight at the top. So, and this is like when the motor spin with the weight, it creates this rumble effect. So if you know, if you played video games before on consoles and like there's explosions happening or something and your, uh, the controller rumbles, it's just like little motors spinning weights and I'm like, oh my God, so simple. Um, but just like, like, yeah, this is like the same motors you can get in any online store. Uh, but then what like double blew my mind is this like little mechanism um, for the shoulder buttons. Um, which is just uh, joint arms that uh, rotate a little um, potentiometer, which is this thing. So it's just like a thing that you can turn and then it increases or decreases the resistance. Um, and um, this is so cool because it's just like two joint arms that um, convert like the motion of like um, tapping the shoulder button, but then also like really being able to measure the resistance in, um, like how, how far you're like pushing this. So like, is it like just like a gentle touch or just like, are you going like all the way, you know, like for accelerating in, in uh, racing games or something? It was like, so simple. Um, everyone can do that. Um, so if you're not like, okay, 
uh, I hope you feel like empowered to like tackle your own electronics hardware things. Um, let me tell you that you're not alone. Um, there's communities for, for everything and also um, communities for like hardware controls. Um, it's usually labeled alternative controls uh, when you look for something. Uh, let's say, uh, or like one example is that uh, even at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, one of the, one of the, or maybe even the biggest uh, game dev conference in the world, um, has an has an alt control um, exhibition space ever since 2014. Um, um, I've linked the the, the list of um, projects that were exhibited uh, in the past few years, just to, like for you to browse and be like amazed with, with what people come up with. Um, and there's also, there used to be a thing called the, the all control game jam. So in the game jam, you get together and make a game, um, which ran officially from 2014 to 2017. Um, but you can still find like um, all control, like under the hashtag all control game jam, like projects and like tweets and gifs from, um, from the games that people made up. And of course you can, for any game jam, bring a little bit of hardware and jam with other people. Um, you're not limited to, to a game jam that is like officially labeled all control. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the end. Um, and I hope like that I could like, yeah, uh, inspire you to make games, but also make controllers and have fun and learn about all this cool stuff that is involved when all of these things, um, yeah, come together and create something nice. Um, and thank you, that is it. OK, uh, thanks, Lisa. I think, yeah, like I said, I just didn't know anything. Well, I don't know much about hardware. This seems like a sort of creative way to get into it. Um, I mean, lots of creativity there. And um, yeah, um, thanks for the uh, the term to, to, to do a web search on as well. Um, so part of, I think, what I'm going to say as moderator is sort of around um, the cool aspects or the nice aspects of, of doing a remote conference. Um, and so, of course, it's obvious that we, we can have uh, speakers uh, from distant or more distant places uh, and there's no need to travel. I think that means we've obviously been able to, to have a few more of, of you speak for us. Uh, and so that's, a, that's something nice. Um, so I'll start to introduce our next speaker, um, Ilona. So um, I read that she doesn't tire uh, talking about diversity. So that's something we try to try to think about a lot at Enthusiasticon. Uh, I like to think and I hope we, we do our best there. Um, and their talk is on uh, how to do how-tos. I think it's a really important thing for, for open, open source software. And it's part of uh, a sort of bigger area that I think is uh, really important. And I'll let her take, take the, uh, the figurative stage. Um, I hope you can hear my microphone. So, um, so that's fine. Okay, so my talk is about um, how you can write a how to, or at least I want to make a proposal of how we could rethink maybe tech manual instructions and documentation and how these look and how we um, distribute them in order to make them more accessible for people who are not as much in the tech scene as others might be. Um, I stumbled upon this because, especially now during Corona time, um, we need to have more things online, homeschooling, home offices, and so on. So we had to find quick fixes. And of course, so there's this thing uh, in between like having to choose a quick fix or a long-term fix and what is accessible and doable at the time. And what I stumbled upon when I was scrolling through Twitter, of course, I have this bias because I, I follow a certain group of people, maybe, um, is people like really urging people to use open hardened software. That's the ice cream and the diamond and for everyone to use it now immediately and if you think about it we have um like kids at home parents at home so not everyone is that much in the taxi so um we need to maybe find ways of how we can have these how to's instructions and so on in a way that everyone can feel like they can 
manage it, they can take the burden and the barriers that might be there or appear on the way. So um, it's a very personal uh, thing, story, how I came across this, because I wanted to keep in touch with my grandfather, who lives a few, like an hour and a half away. And so um, not knowing when I'm going to be able to see him again, I thought, OK, I want to video, have video calls with him. Um, he bought a computer a while ago. He's browsing the web whenever we need some spare parts for the car to repair it. So he's in someone who's really open-minded to new things and trying to like open up things, fix them, and so on. And he's also using a smartphone for calling people because there he can, well, he prefers it um, instead of a landline because there he can adjust the volume with the hearing aids that he has. Um, but as I said, he's also using a smartphone. And on the smartphone, he is also receiving WhatsApp me messages and Signal messages. Mm. Uh, but he's not really that they're comfortable whenever he's like tapping somewhere or is in a new kind of menu and he doesn't know how he got there. He's stressed quite easily and I can totally understand this. And I think this is one key or like very important uh, notion to make that it's okay for people to get stressed when they um, have new technology and use it. And we have to give them or support them by um, towards feeling more comfortable. Um, so I'm sorry if I got lost. <laughs> so what I did is I wrote a little manual and well, it's a little manual. It's actually about 40 pages. So I took a tablet that I had and I was like, OK, so what is step by step the things that he has to do to open Jitsi for video calls? and what might be uh, problems or difficulties that he's um, confronted with because of tapping somewhere where he's not supposed to tap. Uh, so the very first page of the manual, and I have to admit, I totally forgot about this. So what I did, I wrote this manual and I had a lot of screenshots in there. I printed it out, had it in a little folder so um, my grandfather can have this next to him when he's using the tablet to make video calls. And so the first time we had a video call, um, he looked at his manual and the pictures. And I was like, OK, so can you see this and that? And then he would say, I don't see the yellow circle. And the yellow circle is actually just something that I used for pointing something out. And it never appeared to me that he might think that this could be part of the screen. So the important note before him is make sure you tell people what um, are not parts of the screen, but maybe just some errors, circles, signs, symbols that you use for pointing something out. So of course, um, the tablet, um, I have maybe a second uh, note. Um, I did this setup and I did change a few settings. So for example, I locked the screen. So um, it's not, um, it's actually horizontal now. It will not uh, change uh, when he's flipping it and stuff like that. Just to make sure there is as little possible um, side tracks that he could by accident um, take. So of course, harder part, I have to tell him or make sure that he knows where the camera is or also what the buttons are. If I, on, for example, the next page, tell him, OK, for switching out a tablet, you have to push this button. So it's written there. He has to push it longer. And also, it's going to take a while. And then it's switching up. Same thing with, um, uh, like, on and off. And the same thing I did, for example, for locking the screen. And my um, theory, and it's uh, well, it was quite helpful, is to, so paper is page, uh, has a lot of patience, so um, 
use more instead of like doing it really short, like think of every step. Also, um, if I say, okay, uh, should we do a video call through Jitsi? I have to make sure that my grandfather knows what Jitsi is. And also the um, characteristics of the video call is different from a phone call, for example, the first time we made a date for having a phone, um, video call, he was waiting for me to call. So I was in the video call waiting for him. He was next to his phone waiting for me to call to start the video call. Um, so here's just a little side note, for example, the uh, Chitsu symbol for me is clearly blue, for him it's green. So what I figured out is it's really helpful to have like more like the spatial descriptions of where things are instead of trying to describe the symbols themselves. Yes, I will just very quickly go through these slides. It's really just like starting a call, then what do you do? Make sure if it's the, the picture on the, uh, on the top, okay, then you're in the video call. If it's the picture on the bottom, then you're not in the video call. Um, and there is several pages of like troubleshooting uh, pages. So when he's not like, when he's not able to make it all the way through, but is somewhere stuck in between, he has the manual next to him. I have it also open on my computer and I can ask him, okay, so if you go on page nine or 10, does the screen look like this or does it look like that? And that way you can figure out what the problem is. And also he can check what he can uh, tap or change. what is the outcome of this little experiment that I did and what is the things that I want to um, actually like are the things that I want you to take from this uh, little talk with you um, if you write manuals or documentations don't write them too complicated too nerdy too tacky to uh, specific for a certain culture group if you want it for a broad audience because if the resources, the documentation, the instructions are not helpful for a big audience, you really can like make any arguments why they should use it because they just can't. And for example, that's me as well. So the other thing is, and I think this is like a um, really broad argument, like a proposal. If you design something, design it with the people. So in my case, this wasn't an option. I had to do it first, but I had to make changes. And with like every feedback that you get, it's not mistakes that you made, it's just things that you didn't think of and that you weren't able to think of. So just don't take any knowledge for granted, but be helpful for feedback and put it into the second version. So get people in your team. If maybe after Corona, you can work again uh, together in groups at the same time, get feedback while you're doing stuff. Otherwise, get the feedback afterwards and be happy to put it in. So um, I'm a little bit over time. Um, symbols. It's just like symbols that are used in like tablets, computers, and so on. They are so arbitrary. So for example, the home button or the back or the settings, these are things that people might not know what they mean. Uh, so it's really difficult to just try to describe them. Um, that's just like the advantage of pictures and screenshots. Like if you do something, make screenshots, do like a little circle around and then you have the things pointed out already. Uh, yeah, because uh, symbols can be a mess. So of course, uh, sharing is caring and I am happy to give all the 
like the manuals, um, have them spread out and have people use them. Right now, most of it is in German. I have to uh, take some time to do also the English version. Um, the QR code leads you to my uh, blog, and there is like the whole thing. Also, a uh, readme what I did with the uh, tablet, so everyone knows what they might have to change. Um, yeah. So if you have any questions, let me know. I will be on Zulu. You can find me on Twitter and maybe this was an input that wasn't also interesting to you um yeah thanks for having me and bye thank you elona some of that was really surprising uh and i think helpful uh in terms of mindset when when doing this kind of thing um i'm going to tell you a little bit now about our next speaker vicky she's done a fair amount of community work or rather she she does a fair amount of community work, like I imagine uh, lots of us do. Um, and she's going to talk to us about uh, one of her maker project projects. Um, and so I'll let her take take the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'll be talking about my first maker project where you can print your own event game. So a little bit about myself. I'm a coder. I'm a hobbyist nowadays. Um, as you just mentioned, I'm involved in a lot of events. So I've been um, involved with a lot with the Irish tech community. Um, started back in mid 2005, running the Python group for over 10 years. I've been running other initiatives like game jams, workshops, collaborating with other user groups. I also um, advocate diversity in tech since around 2012, because I got sick of asking a question on why there's so few people like me going to events, so I started running them. So those are all my volunteer stuff. My actual job is uh, I'm a maker advocate with the Dublin Maker team, uh, helping them run their uh, annual maker festival. And I also help them with uh, outreach to the maker community, as well as other organizations, private and public, advising them on maker-related initiatives. So here are some examples of some of the in-person events that I was involved in. And uh, they're normally um, over 18s, kind of uh, follow up all my voluntary initiatives, but I do work with other organizations that run family activities. And of course, as my as a maker advocate in my double maker uh, kind of role, I do work with people of all ages. Um, again, here's some kind of um, uh, some of the not-for-profit organizations that I'm currently active involved in from running diversity workshops with Code Race, monthly meetups with Pi Ladies Dublin, events and workshops with Women in Code Dublin, game jams with GameCraft, um, if, on the event committee with Technology Science Ireland, as well as being involved with the intersectional inclusive maker space called Lovely Space, and of course Dublin Maker itself as their maker advocate. So what are adventure games? Um, they can be found as far back as the 60s and 70s on mainframes. They are generally text-based games where you type answer uh, to navigate rooms, fight enemies, pick up things. My first encounter with these adventure games was you choose your own adventure games books, physical books, and you read, as you go through the story, you come across a page where it gives you a few options to go to different pages to either pick a treasure or enemy, and eventually choose your own um, uh, game ending. And you can buy these games yourself on your browser for free. So there's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, um, it was part of the 30th anniversary and, uh, and you find on the BBC website and Darkroom as well. Um, so, um, my maker project was meant to be for the Berlin Maker Fair, which was canceled in April due to COVID-19. I complete the project update away and it's, it's, it's a prototype. So what it does is, is a text-based game and depending on the buttons you press, you interactively make choices on how this story will be generated. So I'm more of a coder, I'm not an electronic-y person. Um, so I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. So I used a uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, so circuit button, I used a mini thermal printer, uh, which is like a receipt printer uh, by Adafruit. I use, and um, there's arcade buttons, a laptop with Python 3, a Moo editor, which is a code editor, which is already on the Raspberry Pi, so I don't have to download, compile, and all that stuff. 
and uh, I use a VNC viewer so because the Raspberry Pi itself does not have a screen or keyboard or mouse to interact with. So I have to use a laptop um, uh, to um, develop my project through uh, VNC. For those who don't know what a Raspberry Pi is, it's a small affordable computer uh, from around 30 bucks. It's a great way to learn about electronics and coding on a budget. Uh, for prototyping, I used uh, PyTop. Um, so there's two versions of it here. So the version on top is the PyTop 3. It's a top shell for the Raspberry Pi, where you can pull down the keyboard to reveal a breadboard. So you can plug in your prototypes. And, and uh, when you keep it pulled down, it's still functional, so which is really cool. Um, the one at the bottom is the PyTop 4. And it's more self-contained, a bit more rugged. And um, as you can see, that I have a screen, a keyboard, or a touchpad. So that's why I need to plug in a laptop and use VNC to develop my project on it. And you can still plug in your, your, your prototype um, into this PyTop 4 as well. I use Python for this project. So that means I use CircuitPython, which is based on MyPython. Um, it is a C implementation, making it compatible with Python and optimized to run on microcontrollers. Um, it is a, a Circle Python. It's a fork from um, MicroPython, and its development is supported by Adafruit Industries. And um, you can access uh, level uh, low-level hardware of the Adafruit compatible products. And it's beginner friendly. Lots of docs. I'm a huge fan um, because of of, of their friendly electronics and phone, as well as uh, Adafruit is, has a fantastic support of the community. So um, my inspiration was uh, from Third Choose Tron from the Berlin Game Science Center. And uh, this is uh, this is your own adventure game. And uh, you, you press buttons with this interactive game and you see the story unfold with different endings. So mine is a very small variation of this. So this is my initial early prototype. Uh, I used the, this is the PyTop uh, version three I mentioned earlier. So I used CircuitPython to, uh, uh, with the buttons to print on screen. As you can see, the keyboard is pulled down slightly and uh, the both the thermal printer and the um, buttons are wired right to the board. Um, so uh, then um, after getting the buttons to work, uh, to print something on screen, I try to get CircuitPython to work with the thermal print to print Something out quickly. Then I use CircuitPython to work with the buttons when click to print something out um, on the printer and on screen. So when I got that working first time, it was amazing. Since there's a 3D printer at home, I decided to print a case for the thermal printer and uh, stand for the arcade buttons. And this made things a little bit easier. It come across some technical issues, um, such as printing an image on a printer, which was too big, making the thermal printer making horrible noises. So um, to fix this, um, I found that the CircuitPython library I was using um, to do what I wanted. So I switched that. I used a Python, a, a Python imaging library, and also resized the image. Another big one was uh, when I switched from using the PyTop 3 to a PyTop 4, it could not see the thermal printer, uh, which is a problem for me. So after a bit of searching, I found um, on the official Raspberry Pi docs, um, it actually showed you how to enable the serial port and um, it was well, and I could see the thermal printer and continue on with my project. I wanted some sample data uh, for my um, because um, every time you press a, uh, a button, um, different text shows up. So it's associated with that button. I was going to use Twine. Uh, I had a look at it. It is a free tool to make your own visual novel or adventure game. Um, it's browser based or an app. Uh, but I ended up choosing a spreadsheet instead because I just want to keep it simple. And uh, I can export that to CSV and then I can use Python to convert this to JSON, which I can actually import that into my game uh, and uh, use that as my data. So a um, few things um, that I uh, thought um, when after my project was um, of course, code refactored because I'm never happy with my code. 
Um, as you can see, my uh, project was in a, a kind of two pieces in a picture. So you have my uh, thermal printer and my uh, stand with my three buttons. I want to make it look like one unit. So um, I could 3D print the case without using a lot of materials. I could also prototype and use cardboard and make it, you know, uh, uh, make it one one uh, one unit. Um, I could stop. I, I could uh, use the uh, pipes anymore and just use the Raspberry Pi, so Raspberry Pi three or even a small Raspberry Pi zero. That will make the unit more self-contained and smaller. And I realized I'm not very good at creative writing, so uh, getting data was a uh, was a tough job for me. So I found that online there's like plot generators, which is really helpful. Generates random data for use to pro for my prototype. Here is a video of my product. Um, as you can see, uh, when I run uh, the code, it'll kickstart the thermal printer. Well, first thing it'll do is it'll print out the uh, maker logo with welcome message, um, followed by options to press the button. And then um, when you when I press the button, uh, it'll print the next the text associated with that game. Uh, and then instructions to press the button again. So I press another button. And again, next part of Avenger Game is printed out. And you choose the button. And this will be the last stage because I didn't want to waste paper. There's always going to be two stages. And it will print the rest of the game, followed by the end. And the credits, my name, when the next Double Maker Festival is on. And also a thank you to Choose a Tron as my inspiration. So that's in my talk. Here's a link to my source code on GitHub. You can contact me via Twitter, um, for, through uh, via YK or Event Geeky. Thank you for listening, and have a good afternoon. Thanks, Vicky. Um, Thank I really like PyTop. I didn't know about it, so I'm going to check that out um, a little more. Um, so we just finished with uh, with the printer. And Tamash, our next speaker, is uh, going to tell us a bit about what it takes to uh, to make, uh, in quotes, a little printer. Um, and so I'll let I'll let Tamash take the uh, virtual stage. So for a few years now, I've had a thing for instant photography. It started in early 2015 when I discovered Fuji's Instax Share a portable printer that used Instax Minifilm, that's Fuji's Polaroid essentially, and connected to your smartphone by Wi-Fi to print pictures. I also had a DSLR back then with an iFi SD card that automatically sent all the images I've taken to my phone. Combining those two things, I was able to take a portrait of someone and print it out for them in just under two minutes. It was my magic trick and everyone loved it. In the fall of 2016, I attended the XOXO Festival for the first time. XOXO is an ex experimental festival for independent artists who live and work online. It's one of the best events I've ever attended, and it's full of the most wonderful people. Every attendee also gets an invite to the festival Slack, like you all did to Zulip if you get a ticket. And the Slack has hundreds of channels. It's where we keep in touch for the rest of the time. I wanted to do a project at XOXO, so as an icebreaker, I used my magic trick. I took portraits of attendees and printed it out for them. And it went really well. I even collected all the pictures on a site called Faces of XOXO 2016. In 2018, someone on the XO Slack posted about the paper in P1. The Chinese made portable printer used regular thermal paper and connected via Bluetooth to your phone. It had a quirky app that lets you print text, images, and a bunch of other things in black and white. And it cost like $60. You could even get sticker paper for it, which is loads of fun. The minute I saw it, I knew I needed one. This was how I was going to step up my portrait game for the next XOXO. And so I did. At the festival, people now get two versions of their portraits, one in Instax uh, in full color and one from the paper end that had a very retro 8-bit look. And people loved it. I repeated the, pro I repeated the project in 2018. And shortly after that, I started thinking about how I could change, change things up and give this project a new twist. Someone at the festival took a few pictures with the Game Boy camera, and they looked awesome. I remember the Raspberry Pi and how it had a camera module, and I started thinking, what if I go full lo-fi and use that with the paper ink somehow? 
The cherry on top could be processing all the images with Atkins and Tittering. The one used in HyperCard, which is my favorite dithering algorithm, because I do have one of those. This, of course, recently got even better with the recent release of the high quality Raspberry Pi camera module. So that's definitely a project for the future. But back to the paper ang, which as far as I knew anyway, only had its proprietary mobile app for printing and nothing else. After trying to reverse engineer the APK without much success, I discovered that it had a desktop app on the Chinese language site of the manufacturer. It lets you print from your Mac or PC via USB or Bluetooth. It didn't take long from there to discover that someone reverse engineered the protocol the printer was using and made it into a Python library anyone could use. Around the time I was thinking about all this and doing all the research, I discovered that my friend Josh May was working on a project called Serious Client that lets you turn any printer into a little printer. And this is the point where you might be asking, what is, or more like what was the little printer? Well, it was an internet connected thermal printer released in late 2012 by the British Rocket Experiment Group, also known as Berg. It connected via Zigbee to the Berg Cloud Bridge, their own IoT hub. It was supposed to be just the first of many devices of a future ecosystem of connected products. The little printer came with an app that could do a lot of things. Print you the weather and the headlines in the morning, your friends for square check-ins, tiny puzzles, and so on. Even better, if a friend of yours also had a little printer, you could send messages to each other's printers, essentially giving you a printer-based social network. Most importantly, the little printer was cute. I mean, just look at it. And sure, it may have been a novelty product, but it was a really fun one. The little printer did okay commercially, Berg made back its investment at least, despite its steep starting price of 199 pounds that was later reduced to just 149 pounds. Its premium price and design was necessary because the internals were costly back then, especially the thermal printing module. That's also the reason why it used Zigbee and not, say, Bluetooth. Bluetooth chips were prohibitively expensive when they started designing the product back in 2009. What didn't do so well, though, overall, was Berg's IoT platform, the Berg Cloud. While the company released a dev kit and built many interesting prototypes for it, including an internet connected washing machine, designing, manufacturing, and releasing your product takes years, and late 2014, the startup ran out of money. They kept the servers alive until the end of 2015, and more importantly, before they were turned off, Berg open sourced a simple re-implementation of the server, codenamed Sirius, which only had the messaging component, the API, and not much else. If you hacked your Berg Cloud bridge, you could connect it to the new server. Not much happened for the next four years, but in 2019, a company called Nord Project revived the printers and the ecosystem around them. They added new features and a better API to the server and released a brand new mobile app as well. I've always wanted a little printer, but back in 2012, I couldn't really justify spending 200 pounds on it. You can't really find them on eBay anymore either. However, by connecting Josh's universal bridge slash printer project with the library that connects to the MyPaper and P1, I could have my own little printer. And so can you. On this slide, you can see a diagram of how everything connects to each other. Node Project has a serious server running that anyone can connect to, or you can even set up your own. Josh's serious client library connects to it, pretending to be a Berk Cloud bridge with a little printer connected to it. The project communicates via the file system with the Python papering library, because at the end of the day, Sirius simply sends a pixel perfect image to the client for printing that one can just dump into a folder that's being watched and then print it. One of the advantages of this model of papering is that it uses the same resolution as the original little printer. Sirius's new API accepts plain text, arbitrary HTML, images, or JSON, so you can even hook it up to, to IFTTT or Zapier or whatever. Here's a sort of live demo of how it works. On this first video, I'm sending a message to my own printer via the app. This is as simple as it gets. Of course, you can add anyone's printer if you know their client key, 
letting you send a message, a picture, or a drawing, or whatever to someone else. And here would be another video of me printing HTML via the API um, using the curl call on the slide. But as I was about to make the demo video, my printer broke. So you're just going to have to use your imagination on this one. There are already people creating new things for the little printer or remaking old things that were once available. You can see a few of them above. Cocktail recipes, weather to-dos, or checking how many people are in the space in space right now. Printer-based social networks are fun. Max Hawkins put up his black and white laser printer to the wide open internet by Google Cloud Print and posted it to Twitter. People sent all kinds of cool stuff to him, and he posted the most interesting ones. I want us to have our own fake little printer-based social network. So if you want to join us, go to tinyprinter.club, where you'll find all the information you need and the stuff we need help with, and most importantly, a link to our Discord, where we're doing a lot of work. Right now, Josh is working on making Sirius Client better, as well as the server. Monica Farrell and I have been working on improving the paper and Python library, which may soon become obsolete. I'm thinking about creating a few more services for it to replicate the old little printer experience like automatically printing out the weather for me in the morning. So grab the cheapest formal paper, um, grab the cheapest formal printer and paper you can find. A paper hang or anything that supports the ask plus protocol will do because serious client already has support for it. Hook it up to your laptop or Raspberry Pi and join the fake little printer revolution. Josh is working hard on a new version of serious client that removes the dependency on Python paperang. Rather, one will just write drivers to different printers that plug into serious client. We already have drivers for quite a few things. If you have any questions, find me on Zulip. Um, you can also write me on Twitter or send me an email. Um, I'll post all the details. Um, on the slide to Zulip. And if you want to keep up with the project, uh, follow Tiny Printer Club on Twitter. Um, once again, join our Discord. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button. Thank you. Thanks, Tamash. Um, yeah, I really liked some of those uh, printers. They look really neat. Um, so everybody, please uh, join us uh, for some random chats. Uh, in the upcoming break. Um, the subscriptions uh, have been reset. Um, so we're going to have about 20 minutes now. Uh, please come back and join us at 10 minutes past four. Um, see you then.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the next round of talks. Uh, when we're getting started, I just want to say thanks. It's been really fun doing this conference and being on Zulip. I've had like a really fun time reading the food chat and also reading the introductions. So even though we're remote, I don't know, I've been having a really uh, fun time kind of getting to know you all. And uh, for our next talk, we have M giving a talk. So that's how my phone knows where I am. I'm really excited about this one, and I'm excited to learn some of the history behind this technology. So it's all yours, then. Hey, everyone. Uh, so my talk is pre-recorded. I recorded it earlier this week, so I'll let them roll that in a second. But I just wanted to say hi and thank the organizers for putting on such a wonderful event. Um, so enjoy. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. So my name is M. I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm also an experimental game designer. I do a lot of work with games and interactive installations that use non-traditional interfaces, particularly a lot of work with GPS and location tech. This is a piece I made a couple of years ago called Computational Planner. It came out of my research at the MIT Media Lab, and it is a site-specific generative poetry walk. This means it is an app you download on your phone, you put your headphones in, and as you walk around Port Mason in San Francisco, a robot poet makes up and reads you poems based on where you are. So if you walk by the waterfront, you're going to hear poems about water. If you walk by the cannons, you're going to hear poems about war, that sort of thing. This isn't really a talk about computational planner, um, but about a technical challenge that I ran into for the first time dealing with it called urban canyons. So if you've ever worked with GPS, on paper, you get 15 to 20 meters of accuracy, which is pretty good. If you're in the middle of a city, though, that could go as high as 100 meters of accuracy, which is really bad and also kind of surprising when you think, well, cities tend to be where you get the most cell reception. Why would GPS data be bad there? What's weird, though, isn't that I was running into urban canyons with computational planar. It's that I wasn't running into them. I was getting two or three meters of accuracy, which is unheard of, and it made me wonder why. And that sent me down this whole deep rabbit hole of, well, how does your phone actually know where you are in the world? And so it turns out the actual relevant question isn't even how do computers calculate where you are, it is how have humans throughout all of human history been able to use technology to figure out where they are on this planet. So let's jump to an arbitrary point in history, which obviously isn't the earliest time that humans have had location technology, but let's go with it. So it's the 18th century. It is the height of the age of exploration. And you're a mediocre European white dude trying to conquer the world. And if you want to do that, you need to know where you are, even when you can't see any land around you at sea. So figuring out how far north or south you are is really easy. If it is noon, the sun is the highest it's going to be. You measure that angle, do some basic math, and consult a lookup table, and you know how far north or south you are. East and west is a lot harder. This is a solved problem on land. It had been for thousands of years. But for various reasons, all of those techniques used on land didn't work at sea. The best we had was dead reckoning, which is a technique you might be familiar today. It's still occasionally used in some applications. Um, it basically works if you say, well, I know I started here, and I moved in this direction for this period of time at this speed. I can use that to calculate where I am now, um, sort of using a known location and distance over time. It turns out this really, really sucks. Uh, this sucks so badly that during the war for Spanish secession in 1707, there was a single event where the British Navy lost four ships and about 2,000 soldiers. To be clear, this was not a battle. What happened was each of those four ships miscalculated where they were through rec errors and dead reckoning and crashed into the exact same rocks. Four different independent navigators not talking to each other made the exact same mathematical miscalculations. This is so bad that every major European power at the time had huge cash prizes available for anyone who could solve the so-called longitude problem. The solution, long story short, is a clock that works at sea. It turns out that it's really, really hard to make, but that's less interesting to us than why a clock is actually helpful. So, as we know, it is easy to figure out that it's noon where you are. We also know, if you look at the Earth, it is 360 degrees around, and there are 24 hours in a day. You do some division, and it turns out that 
every hour is about 15 degrees. So if you have a clock that is the same time as Greenwich, England, and you compare that to your own time because you know what you know when it's noon where you are, you can do some you can do some subtraction there and figure out how many degrees east or west of Greenwich you are. So the technology to get there in developing this clock is surprisingly complicated, but this basic concept goes all the way back to Herodotus. And this is a concept that I'm going to keep coming back to again and again over the next five or ten minutes. That if you want to know where you are, if you and you have a known other location, if you know your distance from that location, you can figure out where you are. But if you don't know your distance, you can use time as a proxy for distance. So we're going to jump forward to the mid 20th century. It's 1950s. Sputnik has just gone up. And a bunch of MIT scientists studying it have noticed something really interesting. They noticed that as they're reading all these signals being emitted by Sputnik, the closer Sputnik is to them, the more signals they're receiving. There's this Doppler effect thing going on. And this sort of Doppler effect is not directly how GPS works. But it meant that 10 years later, when these same scientists were trying to figure out, well, how can we get location technology for military purposes? Maybe you can use something like that here. And this insight that the same way you can find your location with distance from a known location, or use time as a proxy for distance to a known location, you can do the exact same thing with radio signals. So GPS, the American system, has 24 satellites. A bunch of other countries have their own location systems that are not GPS, but are functionally the same. All this satellite does is broadcast timestamps. Your smartphone or GPS device has a clock that is very carefully synchronized to those satellites. And we know how fast light moves. So when we get those timestamps, we can use that time difference to calculate how far away that signal came from. So if we assume we are in a two-dimensional world and are reading data from one satellite, because we know how far away we are from that satellite now, we can position ourselves somewhere on the circle. If you add a second satellite, we now know you're in one of two places where those two circles intersect. And if you add in a third satellite, that is all we need to know exactly where you are in this 2D world. And that's really all GPS is. Like it is 3D instead of 2D. So in theory, you need four satellites instead of three. And if you think about it, you could theoretically use the Earth as one of those spheres if you didn't care about altitude on the Earth, but there's also a whole bunch of other really complicated things going on that I'm just completely hand-waving over about clock drift and synchronization that mean, long story short, this is how GPS works, but there are also very good reasons that there are a full 24 satellites instead of only three or four. But if we take this all the way back to urban canyons, this now suddenly makes sense. If GPS is fundamentally about calculating your location based off of these line of sight radio signals, and you're in a place where like, these radio signals are gonna bounce off of skyscrapers before getting to you, and they're gonna bounce off of different buildings in different ways, your phone is gonna get these different signals from different satellites and have no idea what's going on. Um, but okay, so that explains why I wasn't getting 100 meters of accuracy at Fort Mason, which is not near any buildings and has a big clear view of the ocean. It doesn't explain why I was getting two or three meters. Um, and I don't really have enough time to get into why that is. My hypothesis basically comes down to GPS isn't just GPS. These days, what we think of as GPS or a GPS, assisted GPS really means you're using Wi-Fi and cellular towers and ground stations to augment that data. You're using caching servers to minimize a lot of the GPS handshaking that I just completely alighted over. And if any place is going to have as many bells and whistles as possible to make GPS higher quality, it's going to be San Francisco as the epicenter of the tech world and also a very hilly city. But with my last minute, instead of that, I wanna jump forward to indoor location. So we've generally been talking at a high level about if you wanna know where you are, you can use distance from an unknown location, you can use time as a proxy for that distance, you can use radio signals as a proxy for that time. This also works for things that aren't satellites in space. If you have ever used anything with Bluetooth low energy beacons or Wi-Fi based indoor positioning systems, they work exactly the same. Instead of signals from satellites, you're getting signals from a beacon on the wall, the exact same trilateration math. And you even have the exact same urban canyon issue where you might be 10 meters away from that wall, you might only be five meters away and there could be a human being attenuating that signal strength in between you and the beacon. Um, so these days, the sort of modern indoor location isn't quite as popular for that reason. Um, but sort of the people who are still doing that are specifically using things like fingerprinting and probabilistic models to make this better. And so if your question is, well, can we take those same approaches and bring them back to GPS? 
You absolutely can. Uber is doing so much complicated work to figure out, say, what side of the street you're on when you're in the middle of a city. Um, they're using these sort of probabilistic fingerprinting models. We're also doing ridiculous things like generating 3D simulations of the world and like ray casting where satellites might be coming from. But all of this is what I find so cool. I set out to solve this problem of how does this location ship on my phone work? But the fundamental technology that underlies it is this relatively simple basic math that has stood the test of time for thousands of years. That the same underlying technology that powers your phone communicating with satellites in space also helps you figure out where you are in the museum audio tour and also helped sailors hundreds of years ago figure out how to get home. That's really, really cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Em. I really loved uh, that talk. And it's crazy that GPS isn't just GPS, and there's, I don't know, so much more behind it. And yeah, I'm curious how the uh, clocks on the ships work. Uh, I'm pretty wondering how that works. Uh, yeah, while, while I'm here, I thought I would just tell a story about the worst code I ever wrote for fun, you know, to fill some time. So back when I very first started coding, I was doing like, some like student work is like a, a for a physics uh, my professor and uh, I had to like run some code on the server so I SSH'd into the server but I couldn't like figure out how to like run this long running process in the background so I had to like uh, plug in my uh, laptop you know and keep it running all night while the thing was running because I couldn't figure out how to just like have it run and take my laptop home and uh, come back and check the results. So it was pretty funny. I was pretty worried that the power would cut out or something and I would have to start all over again. So that's that's my story. Hopefully I've come a bit of a way uh, since then, but it was a ton of fun. So for the, ne <laughs> for the next talk, uh, we have Bleep Track. Bleep Track is a hacker, maker, artist, and scientist. And Bleep Track is going to be talking about exploring generative spaces. So I'm really excited for this one. It's all yours, Bleep Track. So hi, nice. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. And yeah, I will take you through a small journey through generative spaces. So about two or three years ago, I, well, I fell into that rabbit hole of generative art. <laughs> and so let's first take a look on what generative art actually is. So the plan is to create some art, and this could be either images, this could be some music, poems, basically everything that you can come up with. And you uh, generate this art with some rule set. And well, most computer scientist people write this rule set with code, but you can also just have this rule set in your head and let's say draw a picture with a pencil on paper, also works. Um, but we, for, for this talk, we will stay in this uh, computer artsy part of generative art. Um, and so um, generative art often works with some sorts of inputs. This can either be random numbers. Um, if you go more into interactive installations, you can have the user interact with the art piece. This might be through sensors, maybe it's just through mouse and keyboard. Um, you also can, of course, use other senses and make visualizations. Let's say you can you have a weather station somewhere and you can make art from the weather data that you're collecting. Or you can um, yeah, go ahead and take other sorts of data, let's say, from big databases like Wikidata and make generative art with that. Um, if we take a closer look on this rule set, you usually have some sort of parameters, it's called. Um, they are basically settings on your rule set. So these can either work like switches, so your, your, your rule set can have a switch that maybe switches a certain color on or off or switches between red and blue or something like that. You can also have settings that are more like rotary dials. So you can choose a number in a certain range. These can be explicit numbers. This can be a more fluent scale. Um, yeah, and you populate these switches, for example, with random numbers. And so this talk is about generative spaces. So let's see what these spaces are all about. Usually, when we talk about generative spaces, we also talk about possibility space. Um, possibility space is 
basically every combination that you can have with your knobs and dials and settings in your rule set, every combination that you can make from these parameters, this is possibility space. So now is the question, what is generative space? Well, when you create your rule set and you create your parameters, you want to have certain switches not interfere with each other, maybe. Some combinations don't look as pleasant. You don't want these. So this is generative space. This is the results of your rule set. And generative space usually is smaller than possibility space. And this is also the very, to me, the very interesting part on generative art to find out how to set these uh, these parameters right, how to configure your rule set right so that every result is interesting. So what you don't want to do is make them e these uh, both of these spaces equal because you will get a lot of boring results. Let's say you create an image that is made of uh, lots of colorful blobs and you want it to be colorful. You don't want it to be that every blob has the same color. So you will to you want to shrink that generative space a bit. On the other hand, you don't want to uh, make your rule set too extreme, too overdefined. In the most extreme case, you could only generate one very special image. This is also not what you want to do. You want to be like in that golden middle, somewhere in that golden middle. So this is very interesting to me, um, and this is, I think, the. Yeah, the, I ha the high art in generative art. So this was maybe a bit dry. So let's take a look at some examples. So this is uh, one project I did, yeah, two or three years ago. It's called Beetle Spot, and it creates fun little pictures of beetles. And I talked about these parameters and these settings, and we can have a look here. So for example, we can change the color. This is one setting, so I can make it more pinkish wait for a small second and it changes, or I can have different patterns on that beetle. So now we want to explore generative space. So we want to find out what can our fancy rule set do. And one very easy thing to do is take all these settings and just change them a tiny little bit and do this over and over again. And what you then end up with is an animation, which is quite fun and very easy to do. There's also some other very easy thing to do in generative space. My browser doesn't want me to go back. Now it works perfect. Um, is on this example. So we are back to our beetles. And what we can do now is choose the one we like best. Let's see, maybe we go with the right one. And what this program now does is take this beetle and look at the parameters and search beetles that are close to this one in parameter space. So step after step, these bugs and beetles here, they should look more and more similar. It doesn't always work very well because that space is also a bit confusing. But now you can see they are already getting very similar, like the pattern gets similar, the colors change a bit. And we can now make step after step until we come out with our very favorite beetle. This is also a thing that is very easy to do with generative space. So see what you're capable of. And we can also take a look not into the typical parametric part of generative art, but also a bit into machine learning. And don't worry, this won't get very mathematical. This is the last fancy graphic I brought. So when you look at neural nets, that can generate images, it often looks a bit like this. So you put your input image in, it goes to an encoder, and it transfers the image to a space called Latin space, which is basically some sort of generative space. It's sort of a compressed version of your image. And when you want to get back an image, you start in Latin space, put uh, information through a decoder, and you get back your image. And uh, Latin space in some uh, sorts works very similar to generative space. 
um, because similar images usually lie next to each other. So we can also yeah, walk interesting ways through the space. So let's say we have picture one and we go to picture two. If we do this in with, our, with regular images, let's say we have the sweet brown doggo on the left side and we want to transform this to the husky on the right side. When we do this with regular images, we would just make some sort of fading, I'd say, like uh, the first picture fades out, the other picture fades in. This is what it looks like. It's not that interesting, but if you do this in Latin space and you walk from picture one to picture two in Latin space, you, you, uh, you get this uh, fancy yeah, interpolation, which, which is to me is really amazing because it was in the middle, like the mixture of the brown dog and the husky is still a valid dog. Like it's not a weird mishmash of pixel values. It's a valid picture. It's just a mixture of these two dogs. So this is really, really interesting to me. And you can do this uh, also as animations in videos. This was, I think uh, in this video, it was trained on ImageNet, which is a very big data set on different types of images and classes. So it's not also, it's not always dogs, like as you can see, it's birds and all other stuff. And then you can also do some other fun. You can, for example, find a vector that uh, makes combinations. So, so we can say you start with a smiling woman's face and a neutral woman's face, and you subtract them and add a neutral man's face. So you end up with a smiling man. So you can, you can do fancy, fancy stuff uh, in this space with um, simple arithmetics. And because my time is running out, I will show you one last thing that I th think is very interesting. This, uh, you, and you might have already seen this, this is called Deep Dream. So it's basically a sort of overfitting uh, on an image generation network that was trained on dogs when it was uh, used on a film from people shopping in the supermarket. And this looks very trippy. So if you thought this was fun and you want to see the two, I think, slides that I needed to jump, you can check out the slides on nticon.bleeptrack.de and talk to me on Twitter, Instagram, or everything else on social media. You usually find me with Bleeptrack. Thanks, Bleeptrack. That was really cool. And that last image was pretty wild. Uh, so my first time at Enthusiasticon was actually this last year and for the workshop uh, uh, someone presented uh, APL which is this crazy programming language I talked about earlier today and it ended up looking like ancient Egyptian and trying to do fizzbuzz in it was pretty mind-blowing so I'm really excited for this next talk which I think is in the same family of languages so right now I'm presenting uh, Serena and John with K means and K Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in for the meaning of K. I'm Serena, I use pronouns she, her, and I'm a data scientist, currently on a three month sabbatical at the Riker Center. And I'm John, uh, he, him, uh, I'm a professional K programmer, and I'm also doing a sabbatical at Riker Center. First of all, what is K? K is a programming language known for being very terse, to the point that it's almost poetic. Um, K is very popular in finance for its high performance, but not very well known elsewhere. And it's a vector-oriented language. What that means is that vectors are first-class types and that uh, um, primitives of algebra over scalars, vectors, matrices, and higher dimensional types. And you might have heard of similar languages like APL, MATLAB, and rumor has it, NumPy, the library that's used in Python for array manipulation is inspired by those languages. Okay, so what's K means? Um, this is an elementary task in data science. Uh, we wanna cluster data um, by organizing uh, the data according to some sort of inherent uh, pattern and form a partition. Um, 
essentially what this looks like is that if you start with a set of points, like say two dimensional coordinates, um, you choose some of those arbitrarily as representatives of your clusters. We're, we'll call them centroids and we choose K of them. Then we, uh, we organize all of the points in our space uh, by associating them with the closest centroid uh, that we've chosen. Then we average all of the points within each of those groups that we found in order to get new centroids that are hopefully more representative. And by repeating this several times, uh, you'll converge on hopefully uh, a good clustering. So we thought it'd be fun to implement k-means and k. And in the next few slides, slides will take you through a step-by-step -step implementation. Um, we'll show you how to select the initial centroids, how to define the sum of square distances, uh, how to assign points to clusters, and how to recalculate the centroids. But before we do that, we're going to um, initialize our inputs. Those are k, the number of clusters we're uh, looking for, and we set that to three for this example, um, and our data. So our data points are a matrix of pairs. So you can think about, uh, about them in terms of x, y coordinates. The first thing that we need to do is to uh, define the initial centroids. And we do that by taking the vector p and randomly select k points from it without repetition. So what we get is a set of k points, so in this case three, with that, that are uh, distinct from each other but come from the matrix p. Okay, so then if we consider um, for a moment an arbitrary pair of points in space, X and Y, um, and each of those are represented as uh, vectors of two elements. In K, we could just subtract uh, those two vectors and the result will be a vector. Um, if we give that a temporary name like T, uh, we could then multiply it by itself. You'll see that in K expressions, um, everything evaluates from right to left, unless you have parentheses to sort of override this default behavior. So this gives us the squares of that difference. And uh, this is how we take the sum of a vector. Uh, this is the over uh, operator and it modifies the behavior of uh, plus. Uh, so this is a lot like, uh, like the reduce function that's in many functional programming languages. So if we take what we've written here and generalize it, the sum of square distances is the sum over the square of the difference between two points, X and Y. Great, so we have a distance function and we want to apply that to our points and to our centroids so we can find the closest centroid to each data point. Before we see how we to do that, let's introduce the Cartesian product. So the Cartesian pro product given two vectors pairs each element on the left side with each element to the right, and it applies a function to, uh, to the result. So if we use the comma operator, the join operator, what we get is a list of three pairs, um, sorry, a list of three lists of pairs. Um, if we apply a different function, say the sum, we get a list of pairs. Um, so if we take our points P, and do the Cartesian product with our centroid C applying our distance function, uh, we get a matrix where each row is the distance from each point P to each centroid C. Okay, so if we take that matrix and uh, we apply K's grade operator uh, to each row of it, um, then what this does is give us a set of, uh, of lists of the indices with which we would need to index into um, that list to put them in order. Put another way, um, what this means is that the first column of the result here is gonna be the index of the minimum element, the closest centroid. Now the way that we say the first uh, is uh, this star uh, unary operator. Um, so this is extracting the first column of that result. This is giving us um, the membership of every point in uh, a cluster. So generalizing again, we can say that the membership uh, given a, a set of points X and a set of centroids Y is the first of the grade up of each of the Cartesian product through distance of our points and our centroids. 
At this point, we need to recalculate the centroids as the average of the points in the clusters. So the first thing we need to, if we have a vector x, um, we need to, and we want to calculate the average, the first thing that we uh, do is we sum over all elements in x. Then we want to know how many elements are in, in x, so we take the count of x. And to put it all together, uh, we take the sum over x and divide it by the count of x. And so to generalize, we can put all of this into a function called mean. OK, let's take a look at that membership vector that we came up with earlier. Uh, if we apply K's group operator to it, um, then what we get is a dictionary that associates the unique elements from uh, this input vector with the indices at which each of those elements appears, so a, a list of uh, these indices. Uh, now, we don't actually need the dictionary part of this. We're just interested in the grouped indices. So we can use the dot operator to cleave off uh, the keys. And now we just have a list of indices into um, this membership vector clustered by uh, which group they're associated with. So if we index into the original set of points P, then we get those points clustered according to the membership vector. So finally, we take the mean function that we wrote earlier and apply it to each of those clusters. And so we'll get a two-dimensional point that is the average uh, for each cluster. And this will be the set of new centroids. OK, let's put it all together. We have defined uh, the sum of square distances as a function. And we use that to assign each point to the closest centroid. We've also defined a mean function, and we use that to recalculate the centroids in each cluster. So given this definition, if we select a random, uh, random k initial centroids, we can iterate to a fixed point, grouping our points p into k clusters, and recalculating the centroids until convergence. Easy, right? Well, there are actually some uh, details that we left out in uh, the way that we wrote this uh, to keep it simpler. Um, if you're comparing this to a more industrial strength implementation, uh, the most important thing that we've elided here is the uh, tendency for k-means uh, calculations to stick in local minima. Um, if you choose uh, a bad set of initial guesses, uh, you might not converge to very good results. So the most important thing to remember uh, that you could do as a refinement on this would be to run multiple trials with a different set of centroids um, and then choose the best result. OK, but we didn't, we didn't do this for accuracy. Um, we did this for fun. And as you can see, a full implementation takes very little code. Um, and even though we've shown an example that uses two dimensional points, the code generalizes to any number of dimensions without making any changes to it. And something that we think it's very neat um, is that even though we wrote everything from scratch, um, just by using uh, basic key features, we have an implementation of k-means, which is very elegant and reflects the simplicity of the algorithm itself. So you should try K and talk to us about it. We're going to be on Solib and on Twitter or GitHub. Yeah, I hope this has piqued your interest. Thanks, Serena. Thanks, John. I really enjoyed the presentation. Up next, we have Knut. Knut is a Berlin-based software developer, and he's involved with the Berlin Open Knowledge Lab and loves all things open. So I'm really excited for this talk, and it's all yours. Cool. Hello. Happy to be here. Um, so yeah, usually I talk at conferences about the open data stuff that I'm doing, but this time I'm actually going to be talking about something that I discovered at my work. I work for a software development agency called Futurus from Finland. And one of the things I do there is DevOps. Um, and that made me work with DNS. And I realized that I had some kind of intuitive understanding of how DNS works, but I wasn't entirely sure about all the bits but I think it's quite an interesting system because we use it so much. We use it every time, every day, every time we make a request to some website, there's DNS involved. Um, so I got quite enthusiastic about it. And I want to take you on a little journey today. So let's start with motivation. Why do we even need DNS? Um, 
I'm not an artist, you'll be able to tell, but uh, we can imagine it like this. So we have a user and we have our router. And our user says, I'd like to visit enthusiasticon.de. The router, happy to help with that, has the problem that it needs an IP address for that. The user doesn't want to know the IP address, they only have the domain name. Luckily, there's a third entity called the DNS resolver. And the DNS resolver can help with can help us with, with that. We give it the domain name and it checks and it realizes, okay, there's two IPs, you can use those, gives them to the router. The router makes the HTTP request, gives it to the user and the user is happy because they get to look at enthusiastic on D. This happens all the time, um, but in order to understand it and to potentially debug it at some point, if you're setting up your own DNS, it helps to be able to look at this. And we can look at how this works. Uh, we can do that with a command line tool called dig, um, because we're digging for information. Um, so in your Linux or Mac OS system, you can execute dig enthusiastic on DE. You'll get something like this. It looks a bit overwhelming, but there's actually a couple of sections that are interesting to us. We have a question section in which we see, okay, we apparently asked a question about enthusiastic on DE. We have an answer section in which we see, okay, there's two answers and there's those two IP addresses that we saw in the little chart earlier. And we see some additional information. In this case, we see that actually my local router, my local Fritzbox answered this request. So it resolved the domain name into an IP address or into two IP addresses. This isn't actually how uh, a DNS request looks. DNS is a binary based UDP protocol and this is just Dick's representation of it to help us understand what we're seeing here. So this is how we get the response. The question is how does my local router now? Surely it does not know all of the IP addresses for all of the domains in the world, right? And we can again use Dick to look at that. Dick has a flag called trace uh, with which we can kind of follow the request to see how this uh, request is resolved. And if we do that, we get something like this. It looks a bit overwhelming, but the majority of the talk is actually going to be about understanding just this. But what you can see already here on the left is that it seems like we're building up something. We start from just a dot, then we have de dot, then we have enthusiastic on de dot, and at some point, finally, we have our IP addresses again. So judging from this, hierarchies seem to be quite important. And that makes sense because DNS in its essence is very hierarchical, right? You have your domains, you have your top level domains, you have subdomains. And what maybe is a bit confusing is that when we're in DNS land, we usually have this trailing dot here at the end, which you don't put in your browser usually, but there's this implicit root where all of the information starts so in DNS, we often also put this trailing dot here. Okay, so with this knowledge that there's a lot of hierarchies involved starting at the root, let's look at this trace again. Okay, it's extra confusing because we actually start reading it from the middle. So we see here that we made this trace request and the first router that answered was my local router, my local Facebook. And it's telling us, we are asking it, who knows about the root? Where can I find information about the very root of the DNS system? And it's telling me, okay, there's these servers and they know more about the root. So these servers, they can tell us everything about the very top level of DNS. There's actually more of them. Um, I left some out, there's uh, 13 of them, um, but they'll all have the same questions. So we ran the, the, the same answers. So we randomly pick one of them from here and we go ask this server, okay, I'm interested in knowing more about enthusiastic on DE. What can you tell me? This server tells me, ah, I don't know about enthusiastic on DE, but I know about who knows more about the DE domain. So who can you ask if you want to know more about everything at DE? And that is a.nic.de or many others. Again, a.nic is one that we randomly picked. So we go to a.nic.de and ask it, hey, what's the IP address for enthusiastic on DE? They tell us, don't know, but I know that you can ask these name servers, they should know more. We go to those name servers and we ask them, what's the IP address for enthusiastic on DE? 
And finally, they tell us, OK, there's these two that you can use. That's kind of the flow of information. But again, if you think about it a bit more, it's a bit confusing. Because we start here, and we know that the root is at c.rootservers.net. So whenever we want to make a DNS request, we need to start with these servers, which seems weird because they are domain names, right? And if we want to resolve them, we need to ask them first. Um, so these root servers are a bit special. Um, these root servers, there's actually 13 of them. They're operated by lots of entities. I encourage you to check this out. It's quite interesting. You can see that this is a very US-based and actually US Army-based project in the beginnings. Um, so go check out that uh, site. It's the, IA, the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Um, they also have a nice website showing you where those root servers are. Um, because there's many of them, there's way more than the 13. And the way that this works in essence is that there's a cheat file. Um, there's something called the root hints file. And this file contains information about all of the root servers. So it's a very long file. I'm just showing you the top here. And this file is usually included in DNS resolvers. So all of your DNS resolvers, they will have a copy of this file so that they know where to start. Let's look at this section in a bit more detail. So we're looking at a.rootservers.net. And we can see here that, OK, for the dot, for the root of DNS, ask this name server ask a.rootservers.net. And then they also tell us, OK, this server a.rootservers.net has an IPv4 address, which is this one. So actually, now when we want to go ask, we can ask those IP addresses, either the IPv4 or the IPv6 address. This is for how long the request is valid. In this, uh, uh, this case, it's 3.6 million seconds, because in DNS, you're often making repeating requests, and the resolvers are encouraged to cache things, because often these basic infrastructure settings, they don't change. So my router won't have to make this uh, query again and again. It can just remember this for the given time. OK. So this is where we start. We actually know the router has the IP address, so it knows where to start at the beginning. So now we get to uh, know more about the DE top level domain. And it's kind of weird again, because if we want to know more about anything at DE, we need to ask the server at a.nic.de, which is a subdomain of DE. So again, we have this kind of weird circular dependency. But again, there's another trick with DIC. We can actually ask air server explicitly. So we can ask the question, what do you know about DE dot? And we can ask one of these root servers. And what we see now, which was hidden in the request before, is that, OK, there is our response. They tell us again, DE is at a.nic.de up to z.nic.de. But then there's some additional information. And this is what DNS calls a glue record. So a server can respond with additional information and can tell us, this is the information that you asked for, but you'll need some more information. You'll also need these IP addresses. OK, so with that, we have IP addresses. We can go on here. We get to this point where now, again, we have a new name server, which is a DNS name. We'll have to make a whole other set of requests to resolve these uh, DNS names up, and, uh, up to the point where we get an IP, uh, IPv4 or IPv6 address. We can ask that server, which is this one down here. And finally, we have our answer. So you see there's a lot of hierarchies. There's a lot of delegation. But in the end, you uh, reach down here. And this is quite cool to be able to look at with DIC, because when you're setting up your own DNS infrastructure, you can now follow along and see where in this chain is something not working. Why is my request not resolving as I expected? So I'm going to leave you with a bit of uh, encouragement. Be like DIC. Keep asking. That's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Knut. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I feel like DNS is one of those things where I never dug deep into it, but then something would catch on fire with it, and all of a sudden I wish I did dig into it earlier. So thanks a lot. Uh, so that was actually our last uh, lightning talk today, and we're going to be finishing off the conference. Uh, for the very end, uh, we have some closing remarks. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, fellow organizer Moritz. So, Moritz, if you want to join the screen, the stream. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Hi again from the intro. Um, 
So I want to use this time a little bit um, first uh, to thank everybody who made this possible and who made this a great event. Um, they are our sponsors, uh, Mozilla, Wuga, and Zulip. Um, and there is um, Mirabai who and scripted the whole event. And if you have not been into the intro, Mirabai has been getting up really, really early for us. Um, that was really nice. Um, and also, last but not least, it could not work without um, all the speakers that have presented today. Um, so we had 16 speakers in four blocks, and I loved how everything, like how I learned new things today and how they start connecting in my brain. Um, the printed adventure game with a little printer, um, the US-based DNS root zones that we just heard about, uh, connected with the power structure that mentioned in Nikki's keynote, for example. And also, I want to, to send a big thank you to uh, all of the organizers. Um, so uh, thanks for doing this together with me. Um, this is the time that I want to introduce a little a uh, surprise guest uh, to you, um, a, a, an organizer who has been uh, helping with the uh, second Enthusiasticon and also has been around when I have not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, welcome, Joel. Joel is Hello. Um, actually uh, going to tell us a little story. Like uh, we, we thought we might tell a little history about how Enthusiasticon evolved. Thanks for joining us, Joel. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I, I wasn't part of the organizing team this year. I kind of missed it, but kind of didn't. <laughs> it was good to do other stuff as well. Um, yes, in 2015, um, I had this idea of um, uh, throwing something that was um, awfully similar to a conference I heard about uh, uh, in in the US, uh, Bang Bang Con, and I think um, uh, yeah, the best kind of flattery is uh, to steal ideas. I actually got in in touch with the organizers of Bang Bang Con and said, hey, uh, I want to do the same thing, um, just with a different name, Enthusiastic Con. Um, would you be okay with that? And they were enthusiastic um, about this happening. Um, and uh, back then, it was uh, something that I did uh, as my job uh, for Wikimedia Germany. Um, and it happened at, in the in the rooms of Wikimedia Germany. So that was the very first edition um, of Enthusiasticon in 2015. But uh, um, there wasn't enough budget uh, left uh, to repeat it the next year. And also, it was... Uh, <sighs> very tiring to organize all of that alone. Um, so when I was approached uh, by Moritz two years after that, um, I was really happy because that me meant that this idea could actually live on. And uh, sometimes you just have to wait uh, until the right people come together. And I'm, I'm so happy that this new iteration of Enthusiasticon has been going on for years now, and um, yeah, it's uh, it can live on its own. So the little bird has left the nest and it flies. Yeah, so uh, that's that's roughly uh, uh, the the history of it. Uh, that's um, if if you want to see something like Enthusiasticon in the world, um, why not uh, look around if um, something like that exists or if uh, people. Uh, exist who could could help you, right, uh, Moritz? Yeah, right. Um, thank you, Joel. So um, I think that is kind of like uh, getting into into the future. I um, have lots of ideas and plans how this can can become a bit uh, of a of a structural thing with Enthusiasticon. Actually, before having it online, we 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 were Berlin based, so. Um, that that was a little Berlin event, and um, I personally, right now, I'm I'm not living anymore in Berlin. But uh, also, actually, many of the organizers are not living in Berlin, uh, and we would have organized it even even um, even if it would have happened in Berlin. Just that we have a place to meet. Um, so I would like to encourage everybody of you um, to see what are the communities that you that you like and that you like to have around, um, and see. Who are the people who are uh, who you could support and who, who are doing great things and maybe need a bit more time if you have the, the time and the, 
and uh, um, yeah, privileged to use your time freely, then I would def definitely encourage you to to think about how you can can spread inspiration. Also, for for uh, BankmanCon, like the um, the idea where it was stolen from, they created a foundation uh, on to making uh, spreading spreading conferences like this in this format uh, around. So keep your eyes open, and I. So maybe for the people who are in Germany, uh, I'm currently thinking about um, founding a, a, a legal structure around this or something like that. Um, so I hope um, that all of you got something out of the event. Also, thanks a lot to all of the attendees on Zulip um, who have been have been great uh, to interact with each other. Uh, that was that was really fun to see and also um, be be a part of. Um, uh, I would finally like to ask you for a bit of feedback if you have it. So um, I will. Uh, in, in the Zulip or uh, by email, feel free to reach out to us. We definitely can do things better. Um, for example, I'm I'm very aware that there's there's some certain structure in the organizing team. Um, I would, have, for example, like to, to be more diverse. Um, and that's just a, like a goal uh, to see where we can go. Uh, I think it's important to have these values and not not like keep yourself from. Uh, doing things, but uh, try to see how you can, how you can um, make the world a little bit better. Um, and I think that end, ends it now. So I have to, I have to pressure on me now to find the last words. Um, just a big thank you for all. Thanks for the stay and take care.